thank you all for being here. Um, I know it was short notice, but thank you for putting forth the effort. Please be patient. I know that we'll probably have some people that should be here. We should have about 15 more friends. And so when those friends get here, they will be trickling in. Um, but I just wanted to go ahead and get started because I know I value your time and I value Kathy's time. So we're going to go ahead and get started if you guys are okay with that. So just a few business things that we need to probably take care of. The restrooms are located right outside this door. Go through the next corridor and then turn right. That's where the women's restroom is. Alex, yours is further down the hall if you need to use the restroom. They have a food and drink policy, but that is more for if we have catering coming in that we have to use their caterer. So you guys are okay to have food and drink. Um, this afternoon, if you guys want, a lot of people have done like Grubhub lately and Uber Eats and that kind of thing. Like you guys are welcome to have food brought to you. You can eat outside on the picnic tables. Today is also the day of the Utah shakeout, so the nice earthquake drill. Because we are at the Capitol, I assume that that's at 1019, and I assume that we will be participating in that. But I will go find somebody after I introduce Kathy to find out where our meeting location will be once that occurs, if it's occurring. Okay? So I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of heads up on that. We'll be giving you 60 minutes to 75 minutes for lunch. Um, so keep that in mind. It's a beautiful day finally in Utah, so that is fantastic. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, my name is Jamie Robinson. I probably should have started with that. So <laughs> if you have any questions, I have my email at the end of this presentation that you're welcome to jot down, as well as Jessica Smith. And then Alicia Steed is also our partner in crime. And so I have all three of our contact information on there at the end of the slides, okay? So the hope for this training, we have been part of what's called the accessible or the assessment capable learning and the way that that program has worked is you go in for a training but then you implement everything you've learned from that training and you come back and do it again and it has actually been probably i've been a teacher for 19 years and that method of a professional development has meant more to me than a one-day conference where you go in you go back you apply what you can at that time but then as you go throughout your career, right, you forget certain things that you've learned. And so what we've done is we've reached out to different vendors, and I met with Kathy through the phone. <laughs> it's the first time we've met each other in person. But we reached out to Kathy and asked her if this would be something that she would be interested in helping us with. And so the intent is to kind of do some more of an intense training where we have more instruction time. We have the t like you guys will get some information today, you'll be able to implement that. We'll come back on April 29th, right? Like 28th, 29th. We'll come back on April 29th, have some more instruction at that point. And then after that, Kathy will be setting up some coaching. And that is why we asked for such a commitment from you guys. And we asked for you to be part of the whole training. Um, we also understand life happens, right? Some things pop up and there may be something that comes up that you can't come to one of the trainings. but. Our hope is to try to get as many of you here to all the trainings as possible because it is such a commitment, okay? The thing that we're trying to also do with that is build you a community of resources. So that's why we have the teacher learning community that we want to be part of that. So I will, after today's training, set up a Google Drive. I will ask you all to write down your emails for me so I have all of your emails. Then I will send out a link to that Google Drive where we'll have some of the handouts that will be accessible. But also, there can be a document on there or a way for you guys to share with one another, say, hey, I tried this strategy and it worked really well, or I tried this, but this part didn't go so well. Did anybody else implement this and how did you? is because we want to influence our students, right? So, do you guys have any questions on any of that? Okay. Um, with the coaching, I kind of been going around and asking you the different areas that you reside in or that your programs are in, I guess I should say, because we want to set up those coaching days for Kathy. Depending on the number of participants will depend on the amount of coaching that you will be able to get. At first, we were hoping to get about 60 participants. We're at about half of that. We have a lot that are participating online today because of the short notice, but like I said, we should have more friends here at the Capitol with us. So 
we wanted to try to set up the coaching days and that's why I was getting the areas that you guys are in so it'll help Kathy, it'll be better for her. But during that coaching time, she would like to be able to come in and observe the classrooms and then it would be great if she could have some time to meet with you as an instructor, but if the program specialist wants to be there as well. So the programs that are putting this into place, you might need to be really careful about having maybe a sub come in that can float from place to place so that she can do the intent of coaching that she wants to do. You guys have any questions on coaching and how that will look? Okay. So, does that cover everything you wanted, Kathy? Yeah, I mean, we can talk more about the coaching, and, you know, because as you're thinking it through the day, you can ask more questions, and then we need to basically finalize something for that first set of coaching. So that, um, I mean, that's only, you know, like a week away, really, when you think about it, got next week, and then boom. <laughs> and that, we can set it up so that it can be as effective as possible. And then we'll just keep growing our coaching from there. But we'll need to figure out something today for that week of the 29th. And Kathy will come to you. So yeah. that was an awesome thing that we set up too. She's like, I'm good. I'm, I'm all good about presenting one day and driving to my next location. And I'm like, you say that until we send you. <laughs> no, <laughs> She's fine I, with I, it. I, She's I, good. I have like a three hour drive just in the next place. I'm good with that. Weather, the whole thing, doing whatever I can do to get running together. Yeah. So this is our agenda for today, kind of what it kind of looked like. We were going to begin at 830, but as you can tell, we didn't do that. But that's okay. And then we'll try to take a break around 10. However, that might be more towards 10, 19, if that makes sense. So we've kind of got our break and then we'll break for lunch around 11.45, 12 o'clock, give you guys anywhere from 60 to 75 minutes to get lunch, enjoy your lunch and come back. We'll have our afternoon session. We'll do another break. We'll wrap up around 3.30 to try to get you out of here before traffic gets really hairy. I commute from Ogden every day, so I understand traffic in Salt Lake area. So <laughs> I will try to get you out of here at a somewhat decent time. Okay. For those of you that signed up, there was a little section on the side. And for those of you that are participating remotely, if you could email me and I'll show you my email next, but you can either get USB -E credits for taking this or you can get the relicensure points. If you are doing the USB -E credits, you do need to sign up in Midas. I actually think you need to sign up in Midas for both of them, to be honest with you, but then indicate at that point, let me know if you're doing the Midas credit or the USBE credit or the relicensure points, okay? Some programs gave a very strong opinion about which, pro which licensure thing that they needed. So that's why we wanted to provide most of both options to you. And then here's contact information. Is it big enough for you guys to see it? Okay. So go ahead and jot that down. Jessica Smith is my partner in crime. Um, she's been with, the, with USBE longer than I have, so you might know her face. She will be here at some point today. And then Alicia Steed is my support staff. And for all of you, Alex is in the back, and he's our awesome IT guy. So we'll say hello to Alex, too. And there's Jessica, and there's Alicia. So they're the emails that you're writing down. <laughs> Do you guys have any questions for me? Okay. Kathy, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Perfect. everybody. Thank you again, as Jamie said, for coming. We really appreciate it. The short notice, I know, can be, you know, big impact this time of year and all that. So I appreciate you being here. I am Kathy Cole, and I'm an early care and education consultant. And I travel all around the United States and help programs and agencies in many different fashions through uh, the area of child development. Now, today I'm sponsored here through Kaplan Early Learning Company and, of course, Jamie and her team. I am not an employee of Kaplan Early Learning Company, so I do not come to these sessions and say, oh, in order to do that, you must buy this. I, I don't do that. I just share, like, 
in order to do this, this is what you can do, and this is best practice, and this is intentional strategies, and have you thought about this? I'm not here to sell any product. I'm here to just provide information and do whatever I can to help everyone work with the children. Um, I'm very happy to be here. This is exciting to be able to do something that's gonna go over time. Um, I'm, Jamie, I was like f looking in and out of the room, but did you share how long this is going? This is going all the way through to March of next year. So that commitment, I don't know what handouts you got or anything, but that commitment is pretty cool to be able to say that you're gonna be getting continuous professional development. And the way that I like to do this is like, for April 29th, right now I've got a skeleton of what's gonna happen, but I will be working on finalizing all that after I learn from you. So every time I can individualize. And I do share with people that um, how many of you are actually in classrooms? So you know that thing like when you wake up and you're really excited about what's gonna be happening with the kids and you've got this great plan and you're gonna do this and you talked about it yesterday and they're excited too and then you get there and the kids arrive and they like mess up your day. Someone found a roly-poly on the way to school and that's all anyone can talk about. I mean, the weather changes and everything changes. So the information that I have for you today is based on how we need to start, but I expect you to mess up my day a little bit. I expect you to like ask me questions so I can share information. So in saying that, that's what I need from us throughout the whole time in order that I can individualize to make it worth your while being here. I've been in the field for over 40 years. I've been working with infants, toddlers, preschool, school age, and then I taught middle school, high school, and college. I skipped kindergarten through sixth grade. There's a whole different philosophy there that I struggle with sometimes. I come to a good balance with it, but I really was, did not feel comfortable working with that age group. The only reason I worked with middle school and high school is because a superintendent that I had worked for when I was like a principal of child development programs in his district, they needed help with their special education component. And he said, I really would like you to come and help us. And remember, you've always told me middle school is like toddlers and high school is like preschool. And they are. They're going through the same developmental stages only for that age. And so that's why I worked with them, looking at individual needs and helping them to revise their systems. But I really just wanna do whatever I can to make this as useful for you as possible. So at any time, if you need more information while we're talking, if you need more, um, I wonder if that's an email coming through or something for her. Um, if you just need anything, just, you know, we're small enough. We can do whatever we need to do. So for today's session, of course, you have a handout. We've got all different types of activities that we're gonna be doing. There will be some small group working together, so it might be that we move around, do that, a lot of reflection. We are scheduled to go to 3.30, but that was based on 60 people being here. So we're gonna be working as we can work. I'll be adding stuff. It's kind of nice when it's smaller because we do get more details, but then the flip side of it, it's not gonna take you as long to talk through everything that small groups need to do, but we'll just keep working. Now at any time, if you need to get up, use the restroom, do it. If you need to get up and stretch, do it. I mean, not many of us in this field sit all day. So take care of your needs as you need to. I'm, it does not bother me at all if someone has to get up and leave the room. And I am like, thank goodness I'm not presenting this way because I would just like be losing it. I mean, it is so beautiful out there. It is just so gorgeous. And I'm from Oregon and I know we're at that point where please, can we have some sunshine? Can we get some warmer temperatures? And I was looking on my phone, and I haven't, this, I've been gone for two weeks now, and I was looking at my phone, and I was like, yay, there's sun coming, you know? I'm like, this is what we need. And I was sharing with my Uber driver this morning, I have missed every single storm since December. I am like, I've been like the last plane coming in, or I've been the last plane going out. I have, this has been like the year of, oh my goodness, I didn't get caught in anything. It is so weird. So I keep knocking on wood saying, keep it up, keep it up. And so I'm really happy to be here. It's gorgeous outside. And maybe we'll do some small group work out on the tables this afternoon to get rejuvenated. Because I know being in here, sitting where you are, I gotta keep you awake because this is not what you do every day. So um, I'd like to just, you know, find out a little bit more about who is in the room. Now I'm not 
real familiar with all the regions and areas of Utah. I can place you know, different towns and things like that, but after this project, I'm gonna know a lot about your state. I have visited here um, several times. I have a lot of family that lives in the area, so I've been, but mostly it's come, go see them, that kind of thing. So if you could just share like where you're working, what your role is, things like that, that will help me to figure out how to, again, individualize more for all of us. So, um, do you want, let's have the rest of Jamie's crew introduce themselves, and that way we can maybe feel comfortable. So, even can you share a little bit more about your background, Jamie? Yeah. So, I've been a teacher for 19 years. I live in Ogden, so I started working when I was 19, actually. When I was fresh out of high school, I started working at Utah School for the Deaf and Blind in the residential department. And then after I was done, I actually earned my teaching degree. That's what paid for me to get my teaching degree. And so then I started working in Weber District, worked in Weber District in a, a kindergarten program for eight years, got my master's in deaf education, so went back to teach at the deaf school, and I've been there for the past 11 years. And so I have a lot of experience with preschool, kindergarten, and first, second grade type area. So that's my background, and that's where I came from. And then I started at USBE in September. So thank you for being patient. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, my name is Adela Brazo, and I'm working with Smart Kids. I just barely start to help in the coaching, so okay. So I'll take this class it will be helping me a lot. Okay, so for I need to help you through the coaching paradigm mm -hmm. because the training is developed for teachers. Yeah. So as we're doing that, if you're not in the classroom, you need to help me figure out how to use the information today because the training is geared for teachers. And I know we talked a little bit about that. One of those reasons is because if you're not in the classroom, your role is probably to support classroom teachers. So the more information we can give specific to teachers, then you can all take it and then use it in your practice as you're supporting teachers. So if you have any questions about how to share that or I've got a teacher that's you know, doing this, how do I share that with her? Those, those are the kinds of questions that'll be okay with me because that's what we need to do, mm -hmm. okay? And then Kathy, don't forget, we need to ask those that are online, kind of like their goals and what they're doing. In okay, the okay. So we'll do the room first and then we'll go. And they'll go online group, okay. So. I'm Katie Pondaco, I'm from Murray. I have taught for 17 years uh, in the preschool there and it's my first year as coordinator. I'm the general ed uh, preschool coordinator. I brought a third of my staff today, one of my teachers from each classroom and they'll introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. So we're excited to be here. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm Mary Thompson. Um, I have a degree in elementary education with a concentration in early childhood development. Taught kindergarten. Stayed home with my two daughters. Went back to work and decided what should I do? Oh, I can substitute and I'd still be available. <laughs> and then I was um, basically a coordinator for um, a daycare program for the children of high school students in our Murray District, and then this job came up, and so now I am with the ECEC in Murray. Okay, well thank you. Three-year-olds. <laughs> Three-year-olds, yay! Thank you. Uh, I'm Colleen Passwaters, uh, I'm at the Early Childhood Education Center, and I've been at that facility for, this is my 24th year, and uh, before that I did preschool in my home, and then I, yeah, anyway. And several other places where I live, but um, I am in the four or five year old age group and love my job. <laughs> well, good, yay! That's always helpful. I always wonder about people that wake up every day and they don't like their job. I'm like, then why are you doing it? I mean, I know paying bills is a part of living, I understand that, but can we not be happy too? That's a part of living also. So, I don't know, I think it's nice. I mean, I feel like working with children has kept me young. And it just rejuvenates every time, you know, we see them, what they're doing. So it's like, let's be happy and enjoy what we do. Oh, we're fortunate, I think. Oh, sorry. Okay. Um, I'm Kristen, uh, Kristen Milley. I've been in the Murray location right after high school as well. So I've been about 18 years. I teach four and five-year-olds. Okay. Love what, what you do. Yay. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you. I'm Mallory Cannell, and I work at the Neighborhood House as I heard that, yeah. This is my first year coaching, and it's been really fun. Okay. And I'm learning a lot. And you're learning a lot. Well, good. Well, whatever we can do to help, that's why we're here. All right, so we have another staff person, correct? Yeah, so I'm from Sweetwater Education. My name is Jessica Smith. So I'm 
I'm the preschool specialist. Jamie, like she said, probably is a preschool through second, so I'm solely preschool. Uh, I've been there for a year. Before that, I was teaching at Davis School District, so I've taught there for five years. Um, been at state for a year, and it's been great. It's been really cool to be on this side of things and to support lots of programs, bring these kind of things together. So. Well, thank you. And you know, we shared your email, so now we're going to just be all over questions for you. No? <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. And of course, we have our wizard in the back. You want to share who you are? Howdy, I'm Alex. Just uh, filming today and uh, having a little bit of bumps in the road. Hopefully, it's smooth. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. And so, how many do we have online that are with us today? Um, looks like there are four. Yeah, four people. Yeah. Okay. So, um, we have Leanne and Brittany from Washington. Okay, and so how can we have them share? Um, I'm shouting at them right now. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, Jessica. Just so you all are aware, they are not participating in the shakeout today, so. Mm. Yeah, when Jamie told me about it, she was like, okay, so I'm so sorry. I'm like, it's okay. This year I've already been through. I didn't tell you, it's been three earthquake drills already this year and two tornado drills. And when I last, um, wow, it wasn't even last Monday. So Sunday night, Monday this week, I actually had to spend a lot of the time in the bathtub because of the tornado watches in Maryland. So it started at 2 o'clock in the morning, and then they just kept, so, you know, not only that, but I've been doing them. <laughs> so I like just, and they always say, don't take anything. No, everything went into my suitcase, and my suitcase went in with me into the bathroom, in the bathtub, and that's where I stayed for like three and a half hours, and then got up and went to work. And everyone's, you know, all the kids were tired, and the teachers were tired, and families were late because, you know, everyone had to get up at 2 a.m. and get into the bathtub, so. Yeah, it's been fun going all around. So have we had anyone that's been able to share online with us? I will let you know. Okay, all right. So let, Jimmy, can you bring in our chart that was completed when we signed in? I'm gonna be trying as we move through all of our training components of this project to have just little things to do when we're coming back from breaks and stuff. Little transitional activities, just little ideas. Through the course of the trainings, you will get a lot of ideas to implement in your classrooms. And I'm just gonna do a few of them with you every time we transition. It could be things you've done in the past, but it's just to show you just small, simple things you can do to expand language and literacy within the classroom. So the first one, of course, was when you signed in and you just categorized, do you have seven letters in your name? And then it's just easy, it's yes or no. And I was sharing with Jamie, it's, it's very um, effective to have children, you know, make that term determination as they're signing in, recognizing their name. They could actually write their name out for you just like you did. Yeah. And then just go ahead and post it. And so it's, it's real simple to do. It brings in um, some of your literacy language and it can also be a mathematical experience. So I was sharing with Jamie, I had this one little guy in this one classroom, they were doing, and I don't remember how many letters they were saying, but let's just say there was eight, or no, six. And he, was, he had eight in his name, but he put his name under yes. And so when she brought it to the group and she was talking about it, and she was like asking him, so how many letters, and she's counting them out with him. And he's like, you know, it gets to eight. And, he, and she goes, so where does it need to go? And he's like, under yes. And she's like, we did it again. And then he finally said, he goes, I have six letters in my name and a couple more. <laughs> and it's true. He does have six letters in the name and a couple more. And that's the way he looked at it. And so oftentimes when we're doing little activities like this, you can see from a child's paradigm. Because he's like, I do have six letters in my name and a couple more. 
So when we're doing little activities like this, it can bring in a lot of what we're asking them to do into recognizing their letters, to write their letters, to see other friends' letters, to determine if they're here or not here, to follow instructions, all of that. But you also can maybe see it through a child's paradigm because he's like, I do have them. So this is just real simple they can do. Does anyone do an activity like this when children are arriving? Where they're, they're looking and they're recognizing. A lot of people do who's at home, who's at school. You know, recognizing names, doing that. The ability to write letters, we'll be talking about that more in our second session, takes a lot of brain development. To be able to recognize takes a lot of brain development. So for three-year-olds, it might be better to do things more with photographs because children see pictures in their mind before they see symbols such as letters, numbers, and shapes. And so when we're building up to them being able to recognize letters, we have to sometimes think about the age and stage that we're working with. So it might not be effective for every classroom, but just a little activity. So between the transitions, I'll be sharing more little activities that you can do with children. And if you've done something like them, then share like what kind of things you've done. So when you're doing some of the um, signing in like this, as ki kids are interesting, is there any special one that you like to do? Or that your teachers like to do? Very simple in this fashion. Very simple in the fashion. So before we get started on our handout, I'd like for you to actually think about favorite literacy and language experiences. Now, for those of you that are supporting teachers, it could be something that you've observed, or it could be something that you did when you were actually still in the teaching practice. So this is basically just, what are your favorite literacy and language experience activities? So online they have these. Do online, online has these. So it's, what is your favorite language and literacy experience activities? So you think of one, and you just go ahead and you write it out. Do the steps to as much detail as you possibly can. And then at the bottom, it's talking about circle the components that you feel are reflected in this activity. So those are the literacy and language components. And then there's a space, an optional space for you to write your name and your center. And this is how we're gonna start sharing amongst all of our TLCs, our teacher learning communities. But take some time to reflect on that, fill this out. You'll keep it with you through the day and as you learn more about the literacy and language components, you might actually then say, oh, that's also in my activity. And then you may end up circling more components. And so then at the end, we're gonna be sharing these all through the day, but at the end, then we'll collect them and make sure that we're able to share with everybody.
take some time to finish your thoughts, please. So hang on to these as we talk today about the components of language and literacy. You can reflect on some more, see if you find any other components that may be actually in part of your activity, and then we'll share before we leave today. So um, Jessica, before we get started, did anyone online provide any information? No, they're having some Okay, all right, then we'll just go ahead and get started. So we're gonna go into our big handout, and so the way we set this up is that today we're gonna be talking about the components of language and literacy. Our next section is gonna be talking about strategies that you can apply into the classroom, and that'll be through storytelling, reading aloud, writing, finger play songs, things like that. Then when we come back in the fall, we're gonna start working on then, like literacy in every classroom area, language in every classroom area. So then we'll look at every area of classrooms, such as blocks, dramatic play, sound and water, and think about how to develop language and literacy throughout all the classrooms. So it's building. So today we're gonna to start with the components, the research, what the components are for this age group, looking and reflecting on what are you seeing in the classroom, what are you applying in the classroom, how are you actually applying the components of literacy and language within the classroom. And so this is like part one and then we just keep developing and building on that. So let's go ahead and just get started. Um, I tried as best I could as I shared to include as much information in here as possible so that for those of you supporting teachers can go back and share. Mm -hmm. So I will be like reading some of the key points from the handout and then elaborating and building, but I'm not gonna read everything. It'll all be woven in there. But we know that um, one of the most important things of our practice has really come to light in just the last few years of our field. And it all started when out there in the world, neurologists and the medical practitioners started, develop, started studying more about how the brain develops. And what hit was a, something that impacted our profession tremendously. I have been working in this field since the 70s, and I'm the only one in my family that did not go into the family business. And I have always had to clarify why I wanted to work with young children. And when all this information about brain development hit, it kind of actually helped my family to understand why I feel this is so important. And what we discovered in all of this research that impacted our field is that 70% of the brain has the capacity to develop by a time a child is 18 months of age. Yeah, and 80% by the time they're three. And what it did to our field is we started looking at those infant and toddler programs and changed them from care to early learning. Because right now, if we don't help those brain neurons to connect, they may never connect. 90% of the brain can fully develop by a time a child's five. So we have children at the most important portion of brain development. In the olden days, children's brains developed on their own rather quickly because of the way our society was. Children actually were able to explore things on their own, were able to do problem solving, were able to do more of the practices that the brain needs to have happen. As we got more and more into parents doing for children and society doing for children, the brain stopped in making those neuron connections. And we need to bring that back. So in the olden days, so to speak, during the time when it was okay for a four and a half year old to walk two miles to kindergarten with another four and a half year old on our own. My friend Michael and I walked to kindergarten every afternoon on our own, two and a half miles. During that time, the brain reached full capacity of development about 19 and continued to strengthen until about 26 when we start losing brain cells. Right now, the brain's not reaching full capacity until 25 because we're not giving children those experiences for their brain to naturally do processing, 
to naturally develop their thinking skills. We are raising children to wait to be told, and we need to make some changes. And when I'm working with parent groups, I say, you want your child to honor curfew at age 15? We're going to start with them right now where they're two, because their brain has the capacity to do this. So when we're looking at language and literacy, we need to remember that a lot of what we're doing through those skills has a lot to do with how the brain's developing. Inquires a lot of thinking processes, and we have the capacity to help them to do that. So it talks about strong literacy and language skills are essential for ch children's success in life and in school. It's not just about getting ready for kindergarten. It's about doing what we need to do with them at this age and stage and getting them ready for life. So no matter what we do, it will help them in the years beyond. Out of preschool, moving, it'll help them. But what we're really doing is helping them for life. So there's a lot of different strategies we're gonna be talking about where you may have to, as a teacher, reflect on changing to enhance your practice, and for coaches and supporting teachers, you might have to feel, how am I going to help them to do this? When I was taught to teach in the late 70s, I was taught to help children going through processes such as, when we're going outside, it's time to clean up, put away the blocks. And now we know we have to do, it's time to go outside, what do we need to do? Clean up. What do you need to clean up? the blocks. We help them and share with them what the expectations are, but then eventually we need to change our language with them to get their brain to think. And I had a teacher one time I was coaching and she said, seriously, Kathy, when you left, I said to myself, Kathy is an idiot. This will not work. I can stand all day asking them, what do you need to do? And they're not going to do it. So then she didn't do anything. She noticed on the calendar, Kathy's coming back. So two days before I came back, she said, I'm gonna try this and I'm gonna try it on the child that struggles the most during cleanup. So she went to him, and I don't remember his name, I'll use my nephew's name, and she said, Andrew, what are we doing? And she said, I just saw him just get into that Andrew mode, and he was ready to do what Andrew always did, which is run around, run around. And she said, what are we doing? And he said, cleaning up. And she went, that's right. So she said, I almost told him, go clean up the blocks. You were playing with the blocks. But she said, I'm going to do what Kathy said, because Kathy's an idiot, and I'm going to prove her wrong. She said, we're cleaning up, so what do you need to do? And she said, he got real small, and he said, I have to go clean up the blocks. And he went and cleaned up the blocks. And I came in two days later, and she goes, oh my god, it does work. I'm like, yeah. Be proud of everything you've taught them and let them demonstrate to you that they can do it. Now, it took a lot more with Andrew over time because he was constantly waiting to be told. So what we're doing with our language with children, what we're doing with our literacy with children and all the other content areas of learning, we need to think about how are we doing it. Language and literacy are so powerful in everything that we do through life. And this is the time when the brain is ready to soak it up and develop those skills. So we need to maybe look at what we're doing with children and make some changes. Today, most elementary school curriculum is based on expectations that children by age five or six will be able to use language for a variety of purposes such as asking and answering questions, sharing ideas and information, hypothesizing and imagining. And if we're not helping them to do this, at the time when their brain is making the connections to do it, they might not be able to do it when they go into kindergarten. And children have a real hard time understanding that question asking, because a lot of times in their life, no one's asking them questions. No one's wanting them to predict. No one's helping them think through what it is going to be as far as if we do this and this happens. We're not helping them reflect on consequences. We're solving everything for them. And we need to make some changes. They need to be able to use appropriate communication and conversation skills with peers and adults. 
That's what they need to do, and they're capable of doing it. Children as young as 18 months of age have the capacity to start understanding more and more language, and we need to help them to develop it more. Have a growing vocabulary and use sentences of increasing length and complexity. They have the capacity to do it, but it might not be where they have the chance to learn it. Eight weeks into the womb, testosterone kicks in. So when a child is in the womb, if it's a boy, testosterone kicks in at eight weeks. And testosterone overshadows language in a brain. So a little boy who's three years old, if no one's reading to him, no one's talking to him, no one's singing to him, he can come into a preschool program with about 7,000 words. A little girl, three years old, no one's been talking to her, no one's been reading to her, no one's been singing to her. She can have about 20,000 words because her brain doesn't have testosterone shadowing it. The little girl's brain is wired to watch our faces so she is going to watch how we say things. The little girl's brain is wired to develop a relationship. So she's going to even watch you do things. A little girl will watch adults talking. A little boy would rather watch windshield wiper blades. A little boy needs movement for his brain to be able to capture things that testosterone sh shadowing. So if he's always told to just go over there and play with something small and never do any energetic movement, his brain is shutting down. So we have to think of these things. If we need to have a growing vocabulary and use sentences of creating lengths and complexity, we also have to think of that whole process of the brain developing. So when we're working with little boys, we need to do a lot of movement a lot of energizing them. We could do finger plays like this. The incy, wincy, spider went up the water spout. And you will capture the little girls because they want to watch you and they want to watch your face. We added this for little boys because their body needs movement. So finger plays are not just something cute. There is actually research behind finger plays to help with this development, to use both sides of the brain for that little guy. Now, the problem with the little girl, you know, she's got this language going on, but the little girl's brain is also wired to multitask. And the problem with the little girl that hasn't learned how to manage that, she is going to talk, 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 Get your coat, gather at the door, and a little girl has gotten up. She's got her coat, she's got your coat, she's got your coat, she's got the other coat, she's, got, she's hurting kids at the door. Don't stand that way, do this, like that. A little boy has gotten up, and he's standing there. Or he may get up and go straight to the door. Or he may get up and he's like playing with his coat. This is the brain development that we know we have to focus on. So when we're working with this age, until they learn routines and expectations, it's, I need everybody to get up and pause so that the little girls can relax that multitasking. And so the little boy, boys can hear. Now let's go get our coats. Everyone goes and gets coats and works through that. Now let's gather at the door. A lot of times when teachers ask me about positive gui guidance strategies, children are not doing things that are socially acceptable, I'm like, it's because of you. You're the one to blame because you're not thinking about it from a child's age and stage and what they need. They need that. And so we have to be able to, I thought maybe I just threw that off, we have to think about that. If this is what they're like thinking that children need as they move beyond us, we have to think about what are we doing at their developmental level to help them do this. Have an understanding of functions of print. Print serves a number of purposes in our society. The forms of print. Print has distinct features and forms. Print conventions. Print is organized in a particular way. Now as we're moving into print and letter recognition, remember I said children will have pictures in their mind before they have symbols such as letters, numbers, and shapes. And oftentimes, if they're not exposed to letters, numbers, and shapes, pictures will stay in their mind until about six or seven. 
And for people such as myself, I still see pictures. I'm a very, very troubled speller. I cannot spell because I cannot see a lot of words put together, letters put together. I can't do it. I see a picture. And so whatever reason in my development, I never advanced to seeing a lot of symbols. But we know this, so we have to make sure that before we jump into print with children, that they have actually moved into their brain. And when we talk about writing stages, we'll see how that reflects. But we just don't jump right into print. And the ability to actually do the three-point hole to be able to write developmentally is still at the age of five and a half, as far as the fine muscle control goes. The ability to write takes both sides of the brain. So things as simple as when they're young, crawling is going to help them to be able to write. Because you're using both sides of the brain when you put this hand connected with this knee as you're crawling. When you do the Frankenstein walk with preschoolers. When you finger paint, that's helping them to use both sides of their brain. So all the things that we're doing to help them strengthen their brain is going to help them read and write. And we don't want to jump into, let's start writing names. Let's start cutting paper. It takes a lot of control to use one hand to hold paper, which is one side of the brain, the other hand to cut or to write. There's a lot that we can't forget in child development. This is what they're expecting as they're moving into kindergarten. But if we jump the gun in their brain, the brain might not make the right connections. And then a child will go backwards. So we have to stop and think about what we're doing. Know that a letter is a symbol that represents one or more sounds, and that these symbols can, symbols can be grouped together to form words, and that those words have meaning. That's a lot for a little guy and gal to take on. But there are different steps that we do to get them there. And we can't skip them. We have to think about what are we doing and go from the developmentally appropriate practice for it. Be able um, to connect, connect what is reading, I apologize, a typo there, I lost my proofreader. Not only did my laptop crash, I lost my proofreader, and my husband's not very good. <laughs> so I think we're gonna have to fire him. So be able to connect what is read and what is heard with experiences to comprehend, remember, and construct understanding. So making all of those connections. When we read a book and we ask children questions about the book and you've just read something in the book and you ask them and they go, huh? And they start talking about what they did last night. I went to Chuck E. Cheese. I just saw this in a classroom this week. She's reading this book and she stops and she asks the question. This little guy is so she calls him, I went to Chuck E. Cheese last night, da 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 And she's looking at me, I'm like, remember, it takes time. It's okay. It takes time. Obviously, I mean, she, I think she had 18 in her class that day. She has 22, but it was 18. And, and out of the 22, she has 13 boys. So she's already working on that, you know, testosterone and everything. It's okay. Breathe. He let you know, if you can get back to the story, get back to the story. If he's going to talk about Chuck E. Cheese, then think about it. It's okay to put a book down because the conversation isn't going that way. When teachers continuously try to read and read and read and the children aren't engaged, then the best thing to do is say, I think we can stop now and go to what they are engaged in. Because if, we've, if we're trying to get children to too much focus on what we want them to do, they can go back in their brain for survival. And when they go back of their brain, there's no learning. They want to talk about Chuck E. Cheese right now. That's all that's on their mind. Getting them to come back to the group may be too much for them. They're suffering trauma at that time. They're not feeling secure. They're not feeling safe. They're not trusting the adult because the adult's not talking with them. They go back in their brain for survival. And that's where they're fighting a situation, fleeing a situation, or freezing. And there's no learning going on back there except survival. So we have to learn to read our children. This is a lot of expectations for children as they're moving in and beyond us. But we have the capacity to put things into practice that will help them to get there. And that's how we have to look at it. Language and literacy learning begins at birth, but too many children are not engaged in a language and literacy rich environment. It's just not happening anymore. I don't know how many times as I've traveled the last couple weeks and over the last couple months where I've seen the here, use this electronic scene and keep quiet. 
and what are they learning? What is it that they're actually doing on those games? Now, some people will talk about that the speed of games is helping the brain to work more effectively, but it's what the content is. We have to look at what is happening in our society. We have all these expectations, but what is, are we doing for children? When they talk about screen time, we have to look at, and I haven't been in your classrooms yet, so I don't know if you have smart boards and people are doing screen time, but we have to look at the amount of time that children are on a screen. I'm always like, when I go into a classroom, they use a smart board a lot for videos for children to dance to. I'm like, why? When we're talking about we want them to be able to use their imagination, why are we putting it up on screen where they're watching people dance and they're trying to dance like those people? Why aren't they using their imagination and dancing on their own? And people, when I'm talking with teachers, they don't think about that screen time as screen time. Well, that's a music video. We're doing music and movement, but they're looking at a screen. And then during small group learning, they've got the tablets out, and each child gets to go over there for like 15, 20 minutes. So one teacher, I recorded it. She did two hours on screen, and then each child had 20 minutes. So two hours and 20 minutes on a screen in class. And I wasn't even there for the full day. So we have to think about what are we doing to help them. We need to have a language and literacy rich environment. And we need to think about what are we doing. And some of the simplest things that we have done over time are what's still best for their brain. So we have to think about how are we creating this language and literacy rich environment. We're not going to leave out the other content areas of social studies, science, math, the arts, technology. Those can all be woven in with your language and literacy. But we need to make sure that we're focusing on that because it's getting lost outside of the classroom. And we need to see what we can do to help them. Remember, if it's not happening now with brain development, it might never happen. So we have them at the most important time. 90% of their brain has the capacity to develop by the time they're five. And if you're getting three-year-olds and 80% hasn't developed, we've got a lot of catching up to do. And so we need to see what we're doing. Preschool teachers need to be aware that language and literacy learning are the most effective when implemented in a comprehensive approach throughout the day. Not just, I'm now just going to do this. It's all day long through the routines. Everything that we're doing, we can create a language and literacy rich environment for them. We have learned that it's not effective for us to stop and do a literacy activity to stop and do a math activity, to stop and do science. For these children, they need it all day long because we don't know what's going on in their brain. We don't know right now, they do not have the capacity to focus on a mathematical situation. So if we have it all through the day, then their brain is going to capture it more. If we have language and literacy all through the day, their brain's gonna have more opportunities to be able to learn it. So we're going to go through the whole day with this. And it's not difficult, it's not hard, it's not extreme. There are just simple things that we can do with children. So that's why we're focusing on this, and we're going to dig deeper into it. Questions or thoughts? Is it making you reflect a little bit about what you're doing in your classroom and what you're seeing in classrooms? You're getting them some ideas of how to help people for the coaches and then what you're doing in your classroom of, you know, maybe I need to change this or do this, or maybe you're giving yourself a pat on the back. I am doing a lot of this. So whatever we can do in these sessions to help you reflect on your practice and reflect on the practices of the teachers you support and, you know, enhance it, that's what we're here for. All right, let's go in and just talk a little bit about the components and then we'll take a break. I just want to oh, let you know that the capital up here does not have enough bandwidth that we need for those that are participating remotely. Oh. So during our break, we're going to move to the State Board of Education into the studio, which is in the basement. And so on, when we take the break, and then okay. we'll start, the, because they are doing a shakeout, we'll start there at 1045. So if we still have the break at 1015, okay. we'll have a half an hour to travel down to US, the Board of Education. Do any of you know the address? Do you need the address? Can I travel yes. with you? Yes, you're gonna actually go in Jessica's car. Park. I'm gonna travel with you. Go. 
Oh, you can go with me. Because I have a state car, so I had to get permission. I know, I like it. I had to get permission to have you drive and ride with me in the state car. Okay, Anyways, I understand that. But it is 250 East, 500 South. Well, that's too bad. Yes. So those that are participating online haven't been able to participate. Okay. But we are recording this part of it. So, so then they go can. Back and watch the recording. Okay. But they just can't participate. And so I think the whole purpose was for all of us to get participation. So for those members, the four, and there are six here. So. Yeah. <laughs> like, let's at least give access to them. So <coughs> just wanted to let you know that during the break at 1015, we will be traveling to USB area, USB. Okay. Okay. There's a couple restaurants near the Okay, cool. Because it's very important. The food is very important. I told all the cafeterias. What do you mean the cafeterias? Yes. Would you like to give me the address one more time? What's the address? 250 East. Uh huh. 500. And then we will be in the basement. In the southwest corner of the building. Yeah, just okay. go down the elevator and then walk all the way to the. <laughs> That's down fine. The the Okay. Okay. Just wanted to let you guys know that. Thank you. Thank you. So we're not going to participate in the shake and bake. That's no, what I was calling it the other day. The shake and bake will happen at 1019, and we'll start again at 1045. So see, we're, we're avoiding. So we're avoiding that. Okay, yeah. perfect. We'll transition. So if you guys want to stop and grab food on the way? Let me like whatever we want to do or. We'll do it. Yeah. Okay, cool, we've got a plan. That's cool. <laughs> All right, so the components of literacy and language development. They're listed there, increased vocabulary and language, phonological awareness, knowledge of letters and words, knowledge of, of and using print, comprehension, understanding and using books and other tests, enjoyment of literacy and language. So when you think of language and literacy, were you aware of these components? They align with your state standards. They actually come through the entire Department of Education. They are research-based, but we are looking at them for this age group. This is exactly the same things that are taught in K through six. But we have to look at it and what are we doing with children. A lot of times when I'm working with preschool teachers, I love to throw out that scene. Do you ever read a story like Brown Bear, Brown Bear? So you're doing the brown bear, brown bear, what do you see? And you turn the page. That's algebra. So we need to start being proud of what we're doing. So like when people ask you, what do you do? You can say, like for instance, you can say, I work with three-year-olds and I teach them algebra and then just walk away. <laughs> because we need them, we need people to understand that we are doing exactly what's happening in K through six, but we're doing it for this age. So when you like, when people start talking about, you know, what are you doing? You can tell all of this. We're doing all of this with them, but it's how we're doing it that's effective. And so when we're talking about national standards, we have national standards for the ages that we work with, and they're all tied into the national standards for the K through six, which are tied into the seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And then each state has their standards that reflect the national standards. So we're woven into that. Everything that we do, and this is all to birth, not just starts at three. This even is reflective of what they have from birth through age three. And we're doing all this. And so we need to start thinking about our practice and being proud of what we're doing and share. But we are doing it in a way that is reflective of the age group. So you need to be proud of what you're doing. So let's go, and we're going to start with some, and then we'll stop, and we'll take our break and go on. So, increased vocabulary and language. Vocabulary and language refer to all aspects of language skills, all spoken language skills. That's what it's referring to. This includes children's growing and diverse vocabulary of new words and very words. Through speech, children learn to organize their thoughts and ideas. We have a lot of children that come, and they can't they can't talk. Do you still have some of those that come in? And they're still doing the pointing and the ah and the, and one of the best things we can do is give them the language because they're not hearing it. I cringe every time I see a parent saying too much for a child that's finishing the child's sentence or saying what they think the child needs. And we do that sometimes in our classrooms, but we're doing it more as a probing to find out what they're trying to say. 
And so I always try to look at it growing up in California and, and going through the whole second language learning of Spanish where someone would talk to me in Spanish and then I would take it into my mind and I would have to turn it into English to understand it and then put it back into Spanish so that maybe I could talk back to the best of my ability. Every child is a second language learner, no matter what language, because they start off babbling and cooing. And then when they're learning language, they have to put it into their mind and transfer it and understand it and go through all these thinking processes to be able to understand what someone's saying and then try to say it. So like when you were learning English, you understand what I'm saying, huh? It's just so difficult. And yet every child is doing that. No matter what language, every child's going through that. I actually had an eighth grade student who said, she goes, Mrs. Cole, I can't take these tests for, before my IEP. And I was like, well, you know, tell me why, Roxanne. She goes, because they're all timed and my first language is Spanish. And so I have to read it in English and comprehend it in my mind in Spanish to understand it and then come back and then answer it in English. And I always run out of time, so they always mark me that I'm low. So I said, then stop. We're going to find you the tests in your language. She goes, oh, but we're going to miss my IEP dates. You know, as an eighth grader, they all know now. I said, I don't care. If it's not helpful, why are we doing it? And you know what? She tested out a special ed. She didn't have any unique needs. She was just a second language learner that needed more time to do stuff. But every child, if we think about it this way, every child is learning a second language because their first language is the ah, ah, babble, coo, all that, and now they're trying to comprehend words. And we have to make sure that we're pacing for that. It's so important, vocabulary, so important. So vocabulary represents an important tool for accessing background knowledge, expressing ideas, and acquiring new concepts. So much of our educational system and our workforce requires an understanding of vocabulary and language. We know we need to do this. And so we have to make sure that we're helping children as much as we can with this process. Children with large vocabularies can acquire new words easily, are more effective readers, and are more proficient in reading comprehension. Why? Because their brain has made those connections. Their thinking and processing skills are getting stronger. So the more they have it, the more their brain is able to work, able to make those connections, able to gain more, able to understand. That's what we have to help children to do. So if we can start small and get that brain going, they're going to be able to do more. An important element of vocabulary development is the attainment of incre increasing variety and specificity of accepted words, words that are commonly used in children's environment or community for objects, actions, and attributes used in both real and symbolic contexts. The more we give it to them, the more they acquire. Very simple, doesn't have to be big to start off with, but we need to do it. There's a whole movement across the United States. Talk, read, sing, and now they've added draw to that. Talk, read, sing to your child. Read to them 15 minutes a day. That's going to help their brain. That's going to help them throughout life. And it doesn't have to be sit and read a book. It could be reading the box of Cheerios in the morning and pointing out different letters. It could be reading signs all the way to school. Just building that capacity, developing that. Vocabulary development also consists of understanding and using accepted words for categories of objects. So the more they gain the ability, the more they're able to formulate more connections in their brain to be able to do this, building upon this. We have to celebrate and watch what's going on with children to do this. And when we think about we're moving too fast for that little guy, or that little girl, then we need to stop. We need to slow down. At that moment, that's the learning that needs to happen. And then the more their brain can make those connections, the more it's going to flow. Now, within our classrooms, it's not like on September 1st, children arrive and they stay with you all year and you don't get any new children. That would be such an amazing world if that happened. But it doesn't happen. So you could be starting slow and really working, and your children are on this roll. 
In October, they've gained more language. They know more about expectations. They have a little bit more knowledge of socially accepted ideas and how to express themselves. And then one of them leaves, and you get a new one, and you got to start over. And those are things that keep us flowing, is watching each individual child to see where they are and helping them. So sometimes when we're thinking about the activities that we're doing, sometimes we're going to need to go back and do them again because we've got new children. But remember, for children ages three, four, up to four and a half, close to five, it can take them 180 days to learn something and retain it. And that's consecutive days. So you could have little Kathy's moving, grooving, got it, and then one day you notice Kathy's going backwards. And you're like, what happened to Kathy? Well, because maybe her brain is pausing, maybe she's learning something else, so it's overshadowing something with language and literacy, and we just keep flowing. 180 days for them to learn these and develop habits. So you think you got your hand washing routine down, and then you realize you really don't. Because something happened and now hand washing is totally wacko. Talk about Utah weather, weather impacts kids. It goes up and down and all around. You can wake up one day and go, oh, this is going to be a mysterious day because look at the weather we're having. We had beautiful weather, now we don't. We had crappy weather, now we have beautiful weather. I mean, even all of us would rather be outside. So think about their internal body would rather be outside. So we have to look at how we're pacing that and what we're doing and how important it is. Children learn much of their vocabulary and basic language complex indirectly through their interactions with others. The more we interact with them, the more we're talking, our mouths for this age should hurt at the end of the day. Because we should be talking, we should be expressing, we should be helping them. The more they hear it, the more their brain's going to make the connection. Language. The rate of children's early language growth and later language outcomes is directly related to the verbal input that children receive when communicating with adults and other children. Talk, talk, talk with them. We're not going to be able to help them learn language if we're not using it with them and pacing ourselves so that their brain can capture it and having it relate to them. I'm not saying we can't use advanced language. But we need to make sure that their brain is ready for it, that it has some meaning to it, that it's got a connection to it. I went into a classroom and they were doing a study of buildings and this little guy came up and I'd been in there a lot so they knew me and he's like, pull in my hand, he goes, I got a word, I got a word. And they have a word wall. And when children came up with words, they could put the word on the word wall and then next to it has the child's name. And he's like, and I can't pronounce it like him, I wish I had recorded him. He goes, look, there it is. And I saw his name and I knew the word and I said, tell me about your word. And he's like, architect. I don't know how he said it, it was architect. And I said, oh my gosh, how did you know that that's that word? And so he goes on this whole story about how his uncle builds things and his uncle has all of these what they call plans, Kathy, and he was able to bring some of the plans in so the other kids could see them and the person who drew the plans, Kathy, is an architect. I mean he just, and he was just like so proud and she was, the teacher was like, yeah, all of a sudden he came in and he goes, have you ever heard of an architect? And she was like, we hadn't even gotten to that word yet and she says, I never thought that he could actually comprehend words like that because he's not real verbal. But you give him something he's interested in and you can't shut that child up. Now it's tied to his uncle, he's got something tangible, he brought these plans in, all this stuff. And one of the activities that they did was children got to pick out blocks and then they got to lay the blocks down on big easel paper and trace them to make their own plans and then they got to put their plan on a table and then they got to build with the blocks to match their plan and so some of the children built their blocks up this way to match their plan, and some of them built them flat, and some of them had them just all layered. And I went to the teacher, I said, now let's look at this through the eyes of language and literacy. You can tell how they can comprehend writing that you're doing up here, writing that you're doing here, or writing that makes no sense to them just by how they did their blocks based on his plans. So I mean, it's all those kind of things, and all of that started with he came in with a word he loved. A big word. Now, I wasn't pronouncing it real, you know, phonologically and all that, but he was getting there and it was important to him. And that's what we need to do. 
So sometimes we're going through the motions and we need to think about how is this connecting to the children. Language is so important. And they're going to develop more of it as they communicating with other adults, with other children, and how is it tied into them. In preschool, children develop the ability to use language for a range of purposes, such as describing, requesting, commenting, <laughs> commenting, commenting, greeting, reasoning, problem solving, seeking new information, predicting, tattletelling. Lots of language spoken when they're tattletelling. I mean, they, I mean, they, you can find someone that doesn't talk at all, but by gosh, someone does something wrong and they're going to come and tell you the whole story. And do any of you have the tattletale phone? <laughs> where they can go and you're just like, I think you need to go use the phone. And they get on the phone and they're like, maybe they're talking to their mom and they're telling the whole story about what Kathy did to them in the block area. It gives them a chance to express what they need to do. They're tattletelling, which might not be a part of your solutions in your classroom for positive guidance over them to solve problems, but they've got to do it because that's a part of honoring how I feel and someone needs to recognize how I feel and that I feel it wasn't done right. And so when you're going through all this, they develop people use language for a range of purposes, tattletelling, listen to them. Because they can come up with a lot of sentences. Whereas other time when you're asking them questions about something you're doing, they may come up with the one word response. But listen to the way they tell on other children. Think about what their brain is doing and the memory they have. And yesterday, when she did da 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 da, there's a lot of comprehension in there but they're relating it back to something that personally happened to them. So those emotions kick in. We remember a lot of things that are tied into our emotions. So when you're thinking about a child's language, tattletelling sometimes really can help you see the vocabulary that they have, the length of their sentences, are they able to tie it all in together, use it as a learning opportunity, and then also start working on, there's other ways that we can work through this besides just the tattletelling. But tattletelling is wanting, you know, respect me, teacher, understand for me, know that what I know, you know, needed to happen didn't happen. That come, becomes real personal. Um, as children develop, they increasingly speak in ways that most are familiar and unfamiliar um, adults and the children can understand. This development pertains to the articulation of specific words and the expression of specific sounds rather than the overall way in which children speak or whether they speak with an accent. So they're building, they develop with any adult in the room, they can talk with anybody, they're listening, they're developing, the little girls remember, they're tied into developing that relationship, they want to watch your face, they're developing it, they're developing, they're developing. And we have to give them those opportunities to do that. So language rich environment means there's a lot of talking going on, a lot of prompting going along, a lot of scaffolding going along, a lot of question asking going on. Building that capacity and as we move through the day, you'll learn more of the strategies. As children get older, oh excuse me, pre preschool children also begin constructing narrative by engaging in extended monologues that communicate to the list and experience a story or something desired in the future. And that's that tattletelling. And that's that coming in and you're reading a book and they want to talk about Chuck E. Cheese last night. Do you have Chuck E. Cheese here? Mm -hmm. We don't have Chuck E. Cheese. We had it in California. But it seems like all around the nation kids have been talking about Chuck E. Cheese lately. And I was like, did they have a special or something? Oh, maybe spring break. Maybe kids went to Chuck E. Cheese a lot during spring break because it gives them something to do and keeps them energized. Hmm, maybe, I don't know. I was just like, we don't have it. And I'm like, wow, every child lately has been talking about Chuck E. Cheese. They must have given out coupons or something. But they want to tell those stories. And we can use those and listen to their narratives, again, to understand what they're able to comprehend, to see what they can grasp, to see if they can talk about you know, the past, the present, the future, all of that by using some of those stories. So when you get to that point, for those of you in the classroom, and you're getting really frustrated because you wanted to do something, and they're talking about something different, change your paradigm and use it as a learning experience. Build on it. Because at that moment, that's what it could you know, really build on, is listening, helping them to be able to keep extending that thought and seeing what they can do. As children get or older, such stories become more detailed, linear, and geared towards the perspective of the listener. So first, it's all about me, 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 me. They really don't want you to participate. They don't want to know if you went to Chuck E. Cheese, because you could say, oh, and I went to Chuck E. Cheese with my kids. They don't care. They're all about telling you the story from their perspective. Then as they get older, they can start seeing another person's perspective. So there's a, an idea, uh, I mean, a, not an idea, a strategy 
that really helps them to do this. Do any of you apply in the classrooms, or those of you that are coaching, do any of your teachers apply the think, pair, share process? So we do it all the time as adults. So like the activity that you just wrote out, this is my favorite liter act literacy activity, that's your thinking. And then I could have told you, find a partner and share. Children can do this, and when we do this with children, then that's helping them to hear someone else's perspective. So when you are reading a story to children, and if they're all starting to ask, I mean, answer questions and share their opinion, one of the things you can do is have children, all right, I need everyone to stop. Now think about what you want to say. Think about it. Now turn to someone else, pair up with someone else, and share. That's helping them to be able to learn that other people have a different perspective, a different paradigm, a different way of seeing things. Now do your best to not say, find a friend. We all need to be friendly in preschool, but we do not need to be friends because their friend may be in a different classroom. Their friend may live across the street and, don't go, and doesn't even go to school. And when you're saying, find a friend, they might be, my friend's not here in school. So we need to be friendly in preschool, but we don't need to all be friends. Just like you need to be friendly with your neighbors and in your community, but we all don't have to be friends. So when you're doing something like think, pair, share, it's not turn to a friend. It's just turn to someone. And it takes a while. So like for three-year-olds, you first have to start with, do you even know where your toes are? Because when you get into this turning to someone, you kind of want them lined up together. So for three-year-olds and maybe some four-year-olds, you have to start with, do you know where your toes are? Because we're born not knowing that our body is connected to all of our think pro thought processes and that we control it. So just getting them to focus on where their feet are. Take their shoes off, look at their toes. Now, turn Kathy and look at Jamie's toes. Now you're getting them to match up with someone. Even do the connect the feet and do the arms and do the rocking stuff back and forth. Getting them to connect with another person before you do the think, pair, share. It's not like you can just start day one, think, pair, share. It's building to that. But in doing that, it helps them to start listening to other people's stories because it's all about me when they first start talking and sharing. Like I said, they could be talking about going and seeing the movie Dumbo and you may have gone with your family and they don't care. They're all about what they thought of the movie Dumbo. But doing something like Think, Pair, Share gets them into that almost kind of manners even, having respect for someone else when they want to say something. So that's a strategy that's very effective, and we adults do it all the time. We're going to be doing it later in the training. So it's something children can do, but you have to start with the steps to even get them there. So when we're talking about the whole process of increasing vocabulary and language, there's a lot of the brain development that goes into it. There's a lot of things we need to be aware of. And then it's more powerful to understand what you're already doing, reflecting on how it's helping them, and then thinking about little things that we can do even more. So questions, thoughts about increased vocabulary and language. Feel like you're doing a lot of it? Talking a lot in classrooms? Helping them? Because that's like the one that we seem to just like flow, flow. Questions, thoughts? Okay, before we start phonological awareness, let's go ahead and take our break and do our transition, and then we'll meet back over there and come together as a group. <laughs> with your foot and that actually brings blood back up to your brain and helps you to focus again. Mm -hmm. Anything you can do at all to focus, get your bl blood flowing, helps your brain to come alive. Are you all set up so we can do the mic? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 
when we were driving back, so you know, you guys were like, I'll see all the people outside. I'm like, why are there so many people outside? And she's like, probably the jail. Probably so. <laughs> yeah. So there was lots of people. And just to let you know, because I'm required to tell you, if there is an emergency, the door is right out here. Yeah, we saw that. If you need to use the bathroom, it's up on the second floor. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. All right. All right. So, questions or thoughts about anything we talked about on your drive over here? Is this working well? Sharing this information first, I always apologize to everybody. you got to go through my lecture first before you get to do fun stuff. Sorry about that. But that's just the way, that's my bargain with you. So hopefully it's just sharing information. A lot of it could be just, you know, again, reflecting on things you already know, but helping you to remember stuff. So a lot of times we learn things when we're going through our college courses and, um, you know, working through workshops. But now it's like, let's think of it again, and now we're going to start applying. But thoughts or questions or comments? All right, let's get back. We're on phonological awareness. Okay, there's a the clock. So, phonological awareness is generally defined as an individual's sensitivity to the sound or phonological structure of spoken language. So, that's what we're thinking of. When we're talking about children and, and sound, keep in mind, again, the development of the child. The inner ear doesn't fully develop until six or seven which is why some children could hear what you're saying and then they're saying it a little bit differently. Sometimes we talk about that, that draw that children will have, they'll, they'll draw words out, or a lot of people talk about that Bostonian accent where they leave out the R's and, you know, I mean, all that. It's because that's the, what their hearing is doing. And the thing about one of the differences between little girls and little boys is the little girl brain is wired to catch more of tone. And, and they talk, talk about all of that when we're thinking of how, how women can pick out the sound of their baby over other babies. So they can hear their child's tone. That is effective in little girl brains, picking out tone, which is another reason why oftentimes they can learn a lot more vocabulary because their ear is developing a lot faster than boys in the tone section. So when we're putting all this together, we're thinking about all that developmental stuff, too, with the brain, not just everything that we've got laid out. We cannot forget about how our body's growing and developing. So it is oral language skill that does not involve any print. And so it's working for a different aspect of the brain, and we're trying to have the brain capture all of it. But it's an oral language skill that doesn't necessarily involve any type of print. Um, it is a skill that allows children to recognize and work with the sounds of spoken language. So we talked earlier about how all children really are learning a second language. They're all trying to comprehend as we're using vocabulary with them for their brain to capture it and to be able to then start articulating it and saying it. Phonological awareness is the fundamental for learning to read. So it's really fundamental in order to do that because learning to read is then actually what? sounding out those words, putting those letters together that form a pattern that makes a word. Some children pick it up naturally, but others need to be taught. So it's developmentally based on how much are they hearing, how much is center interacting with them, what's going on with their brain. Some children pick it up very, very naturally, and others need to be taught how to do this. And so when we're individualizing with children, again, listen to what they're able to do, and then that will help guide you of how much you're going to need to instruct them. By age four, children begin to develop phonological awareness along a developmental progression from sensitivity to large units of sound, such as phrases and words, to small units of sound. So it's all this developmental process, and it's not something that can really be pushed. In a lot of ways, we have to just let that develop within the natural progression for their hearing. Sometimes, I don't know if you've ever worked with a speech pathologist, we've got a concern about the child, they come in and they're like, no real concerns right now. Still developmentally, this is what needs to happen. And being able to speak, you know, is going to require all of this kind of stuff plus the inner ear and picking it all up. So sometimes we may have a concern. That's not our area of expertise. We're child development people. We're education people. When we're really concerned about a child's speech, then we need to bring in the specialist, and then they can tell us if we really need to be worried about them or not. Phonological awareness is an important area of early 
and later reading instruction. It plays a direct role in several components of reading, such as the understanding of the alphabetic principle, decoding printing words and spelling, and an indirect but important role in reading comprehension through its direct role in facilitating and decoding. So when people talk about phonological awareness and you do a lot of rhyming things and you do a lot, a lot of songs that have rhythm to them and you're helping them with distinguish those different sounds, you are helping them to read. So when parents come and I'm working with teachers and a parent comes and they'll be like, so when are you going to teach my child to read? The first thing I instruct teachers to do is to say, well, what are you doing at home? And then we'll tell you how we're supporting that because it's not all about us. I mean, it's about working with them. So it's like, what are you doing at home? Oh, you're not doing anything at home? Well, today I will find some ideas of things you can do with them at home and I will share them with you when you pick them up. You know, it's that, it's like helping them, and then we'll help you figure out how we're supporting them. But it's those things you can tell them, like finger painting helps them to read because it helps them to use both sides of the brain. Singing's going to help them to read. Doing funny little things that help them with different sounds is going to help them. So all that kind of stuff, it's not like sitting them down, giving them a book, and teaching them to read. It's everything that's developmentally appropriate. So a lot of times we have to use what we know about children and what we know about these components to be able to share with families, relax. It'll come, but there's things you can do at home. Because everything we know is that we no longer say that parents are the child's first and most important teacher. Because the moment we say teacher, what happens? They think of us. They are the child's first and most important adult. And there's a lot of things that adults can do to help children be able to do everything that they think they need for kindergarten. So we need to help stick with that. Children demonstrate phonological awareness in three ways. Detection, matching similar sounds, synthesis, combining smaller segments into syllables and words, and analysis, segmenting words or syllables into smaller units. So when we're revealing that, we can take and work that through. And we don't have to do all of them at once, but seeing what children are able to do. One of the um, most easiest things to do with children is that whole syllable thing. Because if they can hear different syllables, and in fact, I've got an activity to do that later, then you know that their sound, the tone, their hearing is getting more and more advanced developing. And it's simple for things to do. And so we'll practice that um, later. Children usually develop um, detection skills first, then synthesis, followed by analysis skills. But children do not have to master one skill before they acquire the next. So a lot of times they are not able to, like there's an activity where um, you can have children, you talk about, you know, blending of sounds. And so you have this, the same last sound of a word, such as, you know, when you're thinking of box. And so you're talking about how, what other words can you, and then you do box. You know, they start picking up on some of those sounds. But some children can't pick it up, but they might be able to pick up on path B because now we're using more of their body. So even though they say they'll pick up on that detection of the sounds first, some children might not. So you know you can work with the three of them, and then gradually they will pick them all up. So it doesn't matter how they're doing them as long as they're doing it. Um, questions at all about phonological awareness? We embed this so much in our practice, it's just like there all the time. Anything silly that rhymes gets them in tune with that and builds upon that. So questions or thoughts about that component? All right. Knowledge of letters and words. Children's knowledge of letters and names is a strong predictor of the success, of course, naturally, in learning to read. So a lot of what we're doing is building to that thing that everyone's always struggling with. I want my child to read. I want them to write their name. All of it ties in, even the increased vocabulary and language. It's not just boom, this is one thing, it all builds in. Knowing letter names is strongly related to children's ability to remember the forms of written words and their ability to treat words such as sequences of letters and to both short and long-term reading proficiency. So it's like all this, and like I said earlier, you need to be proud of what you do because you're working with them and cap capitalizing at that. Knowledge of letter names facilitates children's ability to decode text and apply the alphabetic principle to word recognition. So we start with this letter process. We can't really just jump into names. We can't really just jump into large words when we're wanting to acknowledge print. It's looking at the individual process that goes with it. 
Word recognition at preschool age is mainly pre-alphabetic, the recognition of words by sight and reliance on familiar cues. So remember, their body is still developing. Their brain is still developing. So if they're still seeing pictures in their mind, we have to think about this kind of thing. We have to think about what we're doing and help them do those matching. When you ask a child to write, write your name, Kathy, she may see a picture of herself in her head. So you have to think about that symbol that represents what you want them to do. And when you write out C-A-T-H-Y, um, that is a pattern of symbols for that child until she starts to recognize it. So when we get into writing, when we have our next session, we're going to talk more about how that relates. Um, Preschool children are able to recognize some words in the environment, stop, exit, and some brand names, but usually only in a familiar context. My younger brother, this will date me, is when Taco Bell first came out. Do you have Taco Bell around here? So I just still to this day, and their commercial was Taco, 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 Taco Bell. So anytime we drove by it, that's all he would do. Taco, 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 Taco Bell. So like Taco was the first word he recognized. And when he went into preschool and they were trying to help him to understand Scott, his name was Scott, and to recognize it, he could pick out the T's in Scott because of Taco Bell. So they, you know, I mean, what we're exposing them to is what their brain is going to capture. And we can really help them by working with that. This is a symbol, an illustration, a picture that represents this and then build on all that. So we build that up for them to help them to start distinguishing the, the knowledge of the letters, building into words. And every single word is a pattern of symbols until they're able to recognize what they're doing. And I, can I use this? I can use this, huh? So like when we have um, Kathy like this, and we ask a child to write, and this is kind of getting into writing, knowledge use print, but that's okay. We ask it for a child to write this, and then they come and they do, you know, to the best of their ability, you know, and you're trying to see some of the letters in there. This is not a true representation of them writing their name. This is a representation of them writing down a pattern of symbols that you have written for them. When they have their own piece of paper, their own work sample, and they write like this, and they're like, I wrote my name, that's how they see their name in their brain. They're not seeing this yet. So when we're working with teachers and we're doing assessments and everything, and you have to assess the child's able to write their name, this is what you should assess them on, not this. This is copying a symbol, I mean a pattern of symbols. They're copying what you've written. But if you want to know if they're really comprehending in their brain the C-A-T-H-Y, this is what you look for. And then you ask them, tell me about your name. And if they can say, oh, there's the C and there's the Y, then you're seeing what they see in their brain, not this. Not saying you can't do this. Not saying you can't have their name everywhere. Not saying you can't have name cards in every area of the classroom for them to copy letters. But when you're really looking at how do they see those letters, this is truer to form in their brain than having them copy what you wrote. Does everyone understand that? And that we have to share with families, too, because families will get very, very frustrated when they do a lot of this with them, and then this is what's coming out when they're writing their name themselves, because that's how they really see their name. And you'll notice, I, you know, we'll have some of the writing stages, but a lot of times when you watch children write their name, have any of them ever done where they've actually put, like, a person in their name? You can see, like, a face in there, and they'll tell you because that member, they're seeing a picture of themselves. So then that's what they're doing, is they're actually trying to draw themselves, an image of themselves. And those are, those are things that we need to keep in mind as we're thinking about the letter and the word net recognition is that developmental process in their brain. So when we think about that and we watch the struggling of it, then we know we can work more to help them be exposed to individual letters, which then capsizes on to that they can do them together. If we have them jump too much here, not only with the writing, but also holding the pencil, the writing instrument, and the paper, if we have them jump, then we have to ask ourselves, what was skipped 
in their brain development. That could be detrimental to them later because our brain needs to grow in a specific way and neurons need to connect in a specific way. So we need to take time to do that. Um, coupled with their improving phonological awareness, those children may read at partial alphabetic levels during the preschool years. So a lot of people will talk about that children can, you know, recite the alphabet. Can they actually point out different letters? That's what we're trying to get to, to see. We know we need to start with their, the letters of their name first. I was in a preschool classroom, and she had, like, letters, I mean, the alphabet, like, everywhere. And she had the children's names you know, hanging. And so I started looking at all the letters that were not in any child's name. And so I'm like, why do you have, I mean, I think she had like seven different alphabet charts and things like that. Like, why do you have all the letters up when these are the only letters in everybody's name? Let's start there because it's overstimulating. And it can be very frustrating for a child if we're trying with too many of them. So if you have, like, out of, you know, all the letters, you don't have the X, and you don't have a T, which is very unusual. But if you don't have those, then why are we putting them out there? Let's start with what they're familiar with, and then build and expose them to more. Because that's the way they're going to learn are things that are familiar to them, and that's how we need to do that with them. They may be able to look at some unknown words and use letters and their corresponding sounds to decode the printed word. So the more you're able to expose them, the more they're going to be able to grasp them and then be able to recognize them and be able to sound them out. But it's not something that just happens. It's going to take time for all of them to do that. And that's what's one of the hardest things with our age group is the individualizing. How many children do you all have in your classrooms? Yeah. And they could all be doing this at different levels. And that, like I said, one, in one way it keeps us young. But in another way it can be draining to think, oh, Kathy needs it this way and Jamie needs it this way. And, you know, I mean, we're just all this kind of stuff. It's like, but the more we can help them at their pace, the more they're going to capture it. And then they're going to be on this role and this role that happens. So questions about letters and words. We kind of got into some of the print stuff, but we'll keep going. So, knowledge of and using print. Print awareness refers to a child's understanding of the nature and uses of print. So we can gradually build into this. We're not going to jump right into print until we know that their mind is able to capture some of the comprehension of it. So it's building that capacity. I'm not saying that we don't expose them to it. Especially because if we individualize out of your 18 children, you can have some that are going to jump right into it because of the exposures that they have had before they've gotten to you, and then others that aren't. So it's like we will start with a blank slate in our room until we figure out our children and keep adding to it. A child's print awareness is closely associated with his or her word awareness or the ability to recognize words as distinct elements of oral and written communication. So they start, they tie, they're tying in together. We always say that if we can increase a child's vocabulary and language, which is what we first talked about, we keep building on that, then they're going to start seeing those connections, and then the print, the letters and the words will all start flowing more and more. Children develop concepts about print through seeing print in the environment and observing people using print for various purposes. So when I talked earlier about your mouth should hurt by the end of the day, your, your hands, hands should start hurting, too. When, when you're asking children, like, um, so we went on our walk today, and what did you see? And they're starting to tell you things. You should be writing down. You should be talking about, you know, Kathy saw birds. You should be, you know, doing it for them so they could start seeing. And you don't have to do Kathy saw birds, but, but, but. But you just write it, just writing it. There's a, you know, a time for when you're going to sound out letters, and there's a time when you're going to be writing. So having charts just of what children have experienced and what they've done. Well, when, you, when you're in your classrooms, um, do you have any, any meals together? Is there a snack time where the children are sitting? Anyone eat together as a classroom? And are you with them when they're having lunch and breakfast? That is one of the best times to read the children and to write down responses because they're captivated. 
when you're doing large group work and children are sitting, they could have access to maybe four or five other kids they can bug. But when you're sitting at meal, it's pretty much the kid on this side and the kid on this side and not the child across from me because I can't reach them. So having them be more contained while they're learning how to sit in a group, sometimes you are playing this out very well. So if you're like, at I'm sitting in breakfast and you want to talk about something like, so tell me what you did over the weekend. And then you can be writing stuff down because I'm sitting. So sometimes you look for those opportunities to do it and just expose them to it. And another question as they get more developed, not so much for three-year-olds, but it could be by this time of year, but definitely for the four-year-olds, start doing the thing, tell me what you didn't do over the weekend. And then that, like, gets them thinking a whole different way. And one little girl, she was just, she just started giggling, and she was just, and she just, like, pulled in, and she raised her hand, and she was giggling so much. And so the teacher called upon her, and she goes, I didn't brush my teeth at all this weekend. I mean, it's just cute things, but it's having them think a different way. So doing as much as you can to write out their, um, what people will call dictation, do it. Now, since I said that word, there is now another study that's come out that says writing children's narratives is detrimental to their self-image because they cannot write like you. So I've only heard that one paper on that. I can't even find it. I've asked all my colleagues for it because I'm both taught you write. You, you model, model writing. writing. You, you demonstrate, demonstrate writing, writing so that they can start seeing how your hand moves, how, how you have spacing between letters, punctuation, punctuation and all that. So, so as we're talking, if that, that if I can find it, we may have a discussion about that in one of our other sessions. Because, because right, right now, now someone's like, oh my God, Kathy, did you hear? They're saying now that's detrimental to children's self-worth because they can't write like you. And I was like, well, if we're not modeling and demonstrating, how are they going to pick the skills up? So we're still going to go with the, the research that talks about doing this is a benefit for them, and then I'll see if I can dig into some more. If I can't find anything, I'm, I'm just not going to bring it up. Because to me, it's like that is part of our practice that we've been doing, and the research shows that that is something that's helpful to them. So we'll, we'll talk about that some more. Children understanding that print carries meaning often begins earlier than at preschool age. But the concept becomes increasingly sophisticated during the preschool years, and it depends largely on exposure to print and interactions. So again, it's going to be that exposure. So some children will be able to make that connection that this represents something printed. But, but other children might not have any capacity. And as I'm talking about children, are you in your mind seeing different children that you work with, what they came to you with, what you've been able to do with them this year, and start seeing, you know, the exposure? I wish that when um, families start to have children that somehow every parent would go to, you know, required parenting classes, and we could really have them work not only on the social-emotional, but some of this to help them. It's going to be okay. You just need to talk to them and read to them and sing to them, and it'll be all right, and this is what's going to, you know, because it would be so helpful. I remember going through in this one classroom, and they were starting a whole new curriculum, and it actually tells them what children's books to read, and the very first day of class, it's got this book that's extremely long, and the teacher was like, Kathy, I just don't even know if I'm going to be able to do this because a lot of these children have never had anyone read a book to them. So how can we even start with a long book helping them come together in whole group reading when we need to work with them on just how to come together as a whole group? And I was like, you're right. So we, ha you know, we look at different things that go on. Sometimes you can get a classroom and they're all ready to go, and a lot of them have reading, and, they're, and the other ones they've had nothing. So we have to work with, again, the children that they are. Um, preschool children be able to use print to communicate, to understand the way print is organized in text and books to recite the alphabet and to recognize some letters and words and print. So it's one of the things that we should have is writing instruments and paper everywhere for them to expose that. I know there's been times when I've been in classrooms and I don't know if, if you coaches and the ones that support um, staff have been in classrooms and you're writing and children come over and they ask you, what are you doing? And then you tell them and then they get the paper out and then they start writing too. 
You know, I mean, there, some of them get so, like, into that that they, it's, like, amazing to know that this and what I'm thinking I could put here. And they come up with, and they can tell you what their stories are. And so doing that practice. Um, they develop sophisticated knowledge about print conventions, how print is organized, and how this organization changes to fit various purposes and genres. So if you think about all this, like, again, if you share this with people, this is what I do with children, it's amazing what we're able to do. It's amazing what children are capable of doing. And there's so much learning going on all the time, and we just need to take the opportunity to watch what they're doing and then actually to support them. Children's understanding of print conventions supports their knowledge of the alphabet and letter recognition. Of course that's going to happen. The more we're able to demonstrate to them, the more we have it exposed to them, the more, of course, they're going to pick up on that. And I had one um, preschool teacher call me one time, and she said, so a parent came to me, and the kindergarten's real concerned, uh, the kindergarten teacher's really concerned about this little guy because he cannot recite the alphabet. And so the mom wants me to talk with the teacher about what he was able to do in preschool. Can he be there? And so I said, sure. Well, you know, I'll be there to support. I will not say anything unless you ask me to or if the kindergarten teacher wants more feedback, but I'll be there to support. So while they're talking, have you ever seen that poster that's a poem and it's written the words form an apple? So it's all these letters, and it all forms. It's just like if you just look at it, it's a whole bunch of letters, but it's actually a poem that's written in the shape of an apple. So it's on the wall, and he's over there as the, we're all talking, and I'm watching them, and he's like going, W, R, Q. So he's like doing all of these letters. And so I just started tracking the letters that he's not only able to say, but he recognizes. So the teacher, the kindergarten teacher is like upset because he can't recite the alphabet. He can't say A, B, C, D, E, F, you know, he can't recite the alphabet. And so then I, you know, said, I said I wouldn't say anything, but can I share an observation? And the preschool teacher's like, please. I said, so I was watching him, and he's not reciting the alphabet in order, but he knows his letters, and he can say them. And so we asked him to do it again, and he did it. And then when she said, okay, so now tell us the alphabet, he starts singing the song. Remember, little boy brain, you need more than just the words. So he's singing A, B, C, D. He's moving to it, and the kindergarten teacher says, no, just say the letters. Well, then I got the old Kathy mama back all curved up. And I was like, what are you trying to accomplish? Is this for an assessment? Is this for, and she says, yeah, on one of our Redis assessments, he must be able to say the alphabet. And I said, can you show? And she brought it out. And it says, say the alphabet, but it doesn't say in order. And I said, so let's give him credit for the letters he can say. And then he actually knows and can do the mathematical one-to-one -one correspondence. If you think about it the way that is in your paradigm, it doesn't say they must say it in order. Then let's give him credit. So I said, now let's ask him to say letters to you and mark down the ones he can do. And he said every single one of them. He just can't in his mind do A, B, C, D, but he can sing it. So, I mean, we look at children as individuals and we acknowledge what they can do and we build upon that. And the more she was probably pushing them to say it, the more he was probably going in the back of the brain and couldn't do anything. So we know that they pick this up. So the more that they're understanding print, the more, of course, it's gonna tie them into all of the alphabet too which is what a lot of people want them to know before they get into kindergarten. So we're helping with two different things. Um, any questions or thoughts about print, knowledge of and using print? Okay. Comprehension. Comprehension is the understanding and interpretation of what is read. To be able to accurately understand written material, children need to be able to decode what they read, make connections between what they read and what they know, and think deeply about what they have read. So we have to take those kind of things in steps to be able to help them do it. So again, it's like we talked about reading a story, asking questions, and some little guy goes off on his trip to Chuck E. Cheese. And then we know where we need to start with him. Um, preschool development of narrative thinking goes through a series of stages that ultimately leads to their making sense of stories and the world around them. We don't want to skip these stages. We want to work slowly so that they can capture them. At the earliest stage, preschoolers construct narrative strips 
or primitive counts of story plots that focus on familiar routines and activities. That's what we have to do. Think about those familiar routines, those familiar events. If we read stories that are way too abstract, that are not connected to them, then they might not grasp it. So we need to start with things that can be connected to them. I'm working with another group, and they, it's a specific curriculum. It's not totally scripted, but they're supposed to study specific topics at different times of the year. And this one teacher got in trouble last fall because she also incorporated harvest, lives in a community where it's not just pumpkins that are being harvested, but there's also other different types of squash being harvested and nuts being harvested, and she incorporated that into her lessons, and she got in trouble when the curriculum um, employee, like a person from the curriculum came to see her. She got in trouble, and she was like, but this is the beginning of the year, and if we're not tying things into what they're familiar with, and what's in their real world, then we're not helping them. So I am doing what the curriculum's asking me, but I'm a full day program. The curriculum takes about two hours and 20 minutes, and I've got them for seven. So during the rest of the time, I'm working on things that they will enjoy, tying it into the curriculum so that they can comprehend it all. And she whipped out her book that talked about comprehension. So it's like if we're not helping them with the things that are familiar to them, events that are familiar to them, their daily routine. Those are things that they then will understand and it can build the capacity for them to comprehend more as they keep going. In the next children, stage, children construct narratives, and I can never say that word, so, <gasps> right, which include knowledge about main elements of the story, such as characters and settings, about the sequence of events, such as time, order, and casual progression. So as we're building on that, they will move into that. But first we've got to get them to that, through that first stage. Then they start on the second stage. So we don't want to jump them into main elements of the story. We want to build up to that. And again, what's difficult in our classrooms is you have 18 to 20 children that are all at different levels. And so sometimes when you're doing some of the reading, you may be reading with everyone and then reflecting on it in different groups. You may reflect on it as a large group. We'll talk more about it as we do when we get into the welcome, I mean, when we get into the read aloud section and looking at that. But there are different stages that have to go on to. Then preschoolers come to understand and relate to characters' inter, internal responses, such as their mental processes and experiences. I saw a preschool classroom that had threes and fours. And by this time in the year, the teacher had worked so hard on comprehension that when she read a story to them, then each child got to choose who they were in the story. And then they got to come up with other parts of the story. So if I chose to be the rabbit and you chose to be the fox, then I could write my own little story asking the fox questions about why he did things the way he did and all that. And it just they just kept growing on these stories. And so I was watching this whole thing and I was like, oh my gosh, that's an activity for third grade in the Common Core curriculum. And these preschool children are doing it because she took the time to just slowly work with them. So they come up with these stories and then they take on a character in the story and then they grow on it. Why did you do that? I mean, they come up with all these different things and then they have more stories they add to it. They create them into a book and they go into their library area in the classroom. I was just like, whoa. But again, their brain can handle it if we take the steps to do it in a way, and it was threes and fours, and um, the threes were going to come back the next year, and the fours were going on. Ultimately, children recognize both the external and internal features of the narrative. So comprehension, it's, it's a high-level thinking process, but there's different stages that we need to be aware of to help children to be able to do that. Questions or thoughts? Okay. Understanding and using books and other texts. When children understand books and other texts, they learn that written language serves many purposes. And that's one of the things that we need to help them to understand. That we have, you know, books for enjoyment. We have books for information. We have fairy tale books. There's all different types. We have menus. We have labels. All different types that we can use. And what we need to do is find what a child's interested in and use that the most. 
Um, they realize written language is a valuable tool for learning about the world and a way to communicate to others. Exposure to wordless picture books provides instructional opportunities for children and for teachers into a window of the children's learning process. So uh, oftentimes preschool teachers start off with the wordless books, the picture books at the beginning of the year, and don't carry them on through the rest of the year. Do it because it helps you see what the child is comprehending about the pictures, how much language they have to tell the story. It really is a great way for them to develop their storytelling skills. So like we talked about earlier, listen to their tattletelling because tattletelling is a way to watch and think about and see how much language they can use, but then also use your picture books to see what kind of language they can use, the stories they can tell. My younger brother used to come up with these stories of in the olden days, and da 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 And I think now as I studied him that going back to being the youngest, he was at home, there was a four-year gap between me and him, so he was at home with my mom a lot more than any of us and my dad, and, and I think he was just like looking at, we had all these stories we could talk about and things he wasn't a part of, so he came up with in the olden days, and he was the rescuer of everybody. He was it because it was like, I think being the baby with all of us, he had to find his place. But he would come up with the olden days, and I think, wow. And when I started learning about this, and I started listening to children telling their stories. So use picture books longer than what you might think you um, need to do. The efforts of children to make sense of pictures when they are reading wordless picture books form the foundation for reading comprehension and making that meaning. So it's okay. And even for families, we have a lot of families that don't feel comfortable reading to children, so picture books. We don't need a whole lot of words. We can just tell the story. And I have um, a lot of, when I work with parenting groups, I have a lot of families where we actually, like, will download photos that they've taken at family events and then have the children tell the story and have parents make books with that because the children can recapture and tell the story the way that they see it, the way they saw that family event. Storybook reading, both wordless pictures and regular books, when combined with interactive language activities such as active discussions of stories before, during, and after reading, enhances the children's understanding and recall of the stories. So we don't just read the book and that's it. We go on and on. There's one of my favorite books. It's called And Then the Doorbell Ring. So it's like it's this whole thing about getting ready and all this, and then you have just enough for everybody, and then the doorbell ring, and someone else comes in. And so every time, the first time I would read that book, we would talk about, does anyone have doorbells at home? And, and think about, have you heard it? Because a lot of people don't have doorbells. And so it's like, how do, how do people, you know, let you know you're at your home? You know, building to making that connection with them. And then always during that year, my custodian would come in and he would bring in doorbells. And then he would hook them up with the children. Don't forget to use everybody you can in your facilities. He would actually then work with them and hook them up to boards, and we would put them like in dramatic play, and we would put them by the bathroom so you could ring the doorbell to see if anyone was in. I mean, all this stuff, but we tied it in just from a story, tied it in, and then the doorbell rang, and it just got them, and then they would, all this other stuff, and then, because it's that whole progression and building, and more and more people come into your house, so it's a mathematical process, but just starting with a story and building it from there. Share reading activities allow children to model key components of reading tasks and enable children to discovering the components of reading themselves. Interaction during shared reading creates opportunities for cognitive processes and problem solving. So when we're doing more and more of the interactions, when we do the shared reading, any of you participate in those kind of practices where children get to read part of the story and they're telling it from their own perspective? I love it when teachers work with children uh, talking about, okay, so... What is this? This is the cover of the book. What is this? This is the spine. What is this? This is the back. What is this? This is the title. This is the author. This is the illustrator. Helping them understand all of that, and then you get to the shared reading, and you're going to start. And to watch a child go, what is this? That's right. It's the cover. What is our title? You know, and all that. And you read part of it, and then passing it on and sharing storytelling. That's, I love doing that also at mealtime. I'll start a book with children that they're familiar with, and then we close it and then they do share recalling of it. And children will go, no, 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 that doesn't happen. That goes after this, you know, and all that. And it's this whole process. And helping them to understand that 
all of us can do this and help each other is a good process for community, but it also helps them to learn from each other as they're doing that. So helping them to see that we have, you know, understanding and using books and other texts, what they're for. Um, I know it's difficult to find um, books nowadays that are called encyclopedias, but anything you can get like that for your classroom to help them learn to see things, to be able to touch. I am a tactile learner and uh, have some kinesthetic um, attributes also. So for me, being able to touch and feel paper, I retain more. My husband, I'm a book reader like crazy, and I'll carry like seven or eight paperbacks with me when I'm traveling on the road. My husband bought me a Kindle when they first came out. I couldn't, I couldn't comprehend it. So then he got me a leather case for it to feel it. I couldn't. It's like I gave it to a friend's daughter. I have to feel and touch. And when children of the ages that we're working with are still learning through their senses, again, sometimes the digital experience is not a benefit to all of them. So even thinking about getting some of those other type of informational books, the books of knowledge, and, you, and, I'm, and I told you I wasn't here to sell anything to you, but look to your vendors and get some of those informational books that they can touch and feel, not just always doing research on a digital technology tool. Because some children are at that stage, they need to touch it this way and feel it. Like I'm still a pencil writer. I saw you writing with pencil. I would rather write pencil because I can actually feel lead on the paper more than I can ink. So when I write with a pencil, I retain more of what I've written than if I do it with ink. And that, you know, I mean, I can sit and fill out all the mortgage forms you want, sign my name in ink and not remember a thing. But if you gave me a pencil, I'd probably remember more of what I read on that paper because then I had to sign it in pencil. So we have to look at that for children because children learn through their senses and then eventually through their learning styles, then they tone in on the senses that are better for them to learn through. So they might be tactile and kinesthetic at, yet at a young age and then that fades away. But we know that this is a real strong possibility for them. So the last component is enjoyment of literacy and language. Learning how to read and write opens up limited opportunities for children, giving them an entirely new way to communicate to expand and describe their imagination, and to learn new information. The more we enjoy it, the more they will enjoy it. The more that we can help them to see that this is a, something that is enjoyable, that you're going to learn a lot, the better they're going to be when they have to crack open those textbooks because they know that there's a purpose to it. So the more we can keep it enjoyable for them, then they know that when we do things that we like to do, when we're enjoying something, our brain is lit up in all kinds of colors. When we do something we don't like to do, our brain is gray. Now, taking that on, I am an avid reader. I love to read. But as I was going through college, there were some courses I took that I really didn't really have anything to do with them. I wasn't going to ever use them again, but I had to take them to meet a requirement. So I learned how to read different ways so that I could capture through information. But I always like ready to open that book up because it's going to give me some information. So what we can do through this process is helping them to feel good about it and to enjoy it and to like it, which gets their brain open for learning, which they can learn more. So we can do that. Participation in such literacy and language development activities, such as handling books and listening to stories, leads to continuing engagement with text and to motivate and persistence in reading challenges, to challenge that reading task, to do it. It is so much a part of not only our school life, but our life in general. Literacy and language are woven in. Thinking about someone going to work for the first time at, at Starbucks, all of the oral instructions they're going to be given on how to work with people, all of that, everything we do is tied in in our lives to literacy and language, not just school. So going way back to the beginning, anything that we can do, with them right now through literacy and language is going to help them be successful in life and not just school. So the more we can get them to enjoy it, the better off it's going to be. Because more enjoyment keeps us at the center of the brain where we're learning through executive function. If we don't enjoy it, we can go to the back of our brain where all we're trying to do is survive the situation. So keep it enjoying. Children who are read to more frequently and from an early age tend to have greater interest in literacy, exhibit superior literacy skills during the preschool and school years, choose reading more frequently, initiate reading sessions on their own, and show greater engagement during reading sessions. So we can help them to do this. 
and we can help them to actually use it as something that is going to be helpful to them for the rest of their life. So those are the language and literacy components. Thank you for sitting through the lecture portion. Questions or thoughts? When we come back, we're going to look at more of the research and have you reflect on what are you doing in your classroom that is, re, you know, aligned to the research. So we're going to break for lunch. But before we break for lunch, we have two more people join us. Hi there. Welcome, welcome. So I'm Kathy Cole, and I'm facilitating the workshop, and I'm hoping to see more and more people join us. But can you share with us who you are and where you come from and did you come to the right workshop? How did you find us in the basement? We're from Blue Rose, and we were in class for eight months. And after we helped my preschool class get a few things going, we decided just to come. Just to come. Well, welcome. We appreciate you being here. Do you have a copy of the handout? Okay. Okay, because just want to make sure I'm, I'm just talking and talking. I thought, well, I'm going to wait till we get to the end and then check in with you. So thanks for coming. We're glad you're here. And... We're going to break for lunch, and when we come back, we'll talk more about the research in, as far as the components and then get more into the different, um, some of the different strategies that you can do to apply some of the components. And remember, this is just the beginning, and then we just keep growing through our sessions as we do this. So announcements or thoughts? I've discovered the Google Drive, so if I can get all of your emails, I will share with you the Google Drive, and we'll have all the handouts in there as well. And then if you guys get the information that you talked about this morning, in the area for us to share, that will be there for us to do. Is there a recording of this morning? Yes, there yes. will be one. Yes. Yes. So we'll have that. So, all right, let's break for lunch. So I know a lot of people like clap out syllables. I don't know if you've ever done it to head, shoulders, knees, and toes. But, again, it gets the body more so you can do, you know, like hip. Oh, potum, you know, that kind of stuff. And then do you ever do head, shoulders, knees, and toes backwards? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that always gets me. Or do you ever do it silent? I love the silent where you just do that. You just have them stand there. <laughs> you know, just real quiet. Or do it where they're not, you can't see them. They can't see you. Anyway, so just fun with syllables, little transitional activity, lay that out for you. We're going to move into now looking at more of the research behind the components. And the way that I want to do this is I would like to group the teachers together and then coaches and leadership together so that when you're looking at this, you're talking you know, to each other and reflecting on what is it when you're in the classroom teaching that you're doing that's reflective of components. And then for coaches and support, what are you seeing teachers doing? So we have four teachers and four coaches and support. So if we can put coaches and leadership on this side, we can use these two tables and just turn around. We'll get this out of the way. I don't know if it's going to bug anything. I'll stick it up here. And, from the Dom, okay, yes. they move. Oh, hold on a moment. I've got to do and we've got rolling chairs, so our other teacher could even just roll on up here. So in the actual handout, you have the components listed with research. Now, I'm not asking you to go through every single component, but kind of read through them and then choose one that you would like to sit and talk about and say, this is what the research does, and then this is what I'm doing in the classroom. And then I actually have a handout that gives you more ideas of what you can do in the classroom. And so for those of you that were doing it or trying to do it through the webinar, you already have that handout. So no cheating right now, all right? Use from your experience. So um, teachers over here, coaches and leadership on that side, and we'll go ahead and get started with us. Is this the handout? Yes, it is. So we're working from here first, in here first. And then they don't have this yet. No, nope, that's fine. You want one that's stapled? <laughs> um, that might be nice, in order. Um, yes. Was our extra? On their own. No, they're doing the same thing too, and all that. They're each group's working independently on this. Yeah. I just have we like coaches, so I'm like, if we use your mic, they can hear this conversation. Oh, okay. So if you still need 
But do we have, where are the rest of the extra copies? Well, because those aren't stapled. They just printed them. Actually, I'll turn it off. There's a mic. So you're just saying you're an assistant director. Okay. I'm a coach. I'm a program coordinator. Okay, gotcha. What this is what we have. And then the two coaches are online. Like, okay. Other two coaches. And then she's also a coach, but she's not back yet. So. Okay. <laughs> so you'll notice that for each, and we're not charting on paper because we have a small group. It says chart your information on chart paper. So each component now is listed with actual research as to you know what the component's all about. We had a discussion this morning, so some of what we talked about is listed in here, and then there's other new information about the research. And what you're just doing is you can look at each component independently and then choose one as a team and maybe talk about what you've been seeing in the classroom that demonstrates what, that they are applying the component and the research in the classroom. And then I have a handout that I will give you that will give you ideas of what teachers can do to facilitate the component. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. So we'll read this one independently. Sure. Okay. One component. One of these. No. One component. One whole component. One whole component. Yeah. Oh. So you're choosing one whole component. So you're looking at all the components independently, and then as a team, choose one component to reflect on. As far as you, it would be like, what are you doing in the classroom that aligns with that component? And over here, you would be doing, what do you see teachers doing that aligns with the component? I don't uh, it's fun that you guys are working in coordinators and um, just joining over all of what are so many things that we can do. Yeah. Remember we just introduced in that program was Euphonics. It's a you know, language literacy program mm -hmm. that focuses on the phonemes of the alphabet sure. rather than the <laughs> um, actual letters themselves. <laughs> so we're doing a lot of follow-up awareness right now. So it seems like I have read somewhere not too long ago that more and more research is proving that you want sounds more than letters. Knowing the sounds right. is more important than yeah. the names of the letters. <coughs> yeah. That's something I think it was at the beginning. Um, which Kathy was talking about. Yeah, and I miss the first, so I feel like it's, 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 it's like the basis. That's how you learn to read, really. First of all, names. Letters to me. It's not really matters. Letters, letters aren't the same part. I agree with that. It's funny how, you know, if you look at one, you automatically pull in the other, because I was looking at literacy and language, and my first thought was increased vocabulary. This is such a, especially like passage. Um, vocabulary and language is everything. And what we're finding more and more, I don't know if you guys are seeing this, is if we let them get out of preschool without being able to express their needs and wants in an effective way, I don't care if they know their ABCs. If they can't express their needs and wants, we're in trouble. Yeah, I mean, they can't do anything else. Right. About that. So that's a big deal to, to me. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we're just be reading like this and then discuss it and then read the next one. No, yeah. we're supposed to go on the wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. But I think speaking to that, what you were talking about, increasing the vocabulary and language, um, looking at the different components of it and going back to what uh, you missed it in the earlier when she talked about the parents are doing everything for the kids mm -hmm. like, instead of waiting and letting them call them all the week on that at our school as well. Our littles are coming in like, 
need as much encouragement as we give them to all of their things independently. The parents still pick up the kind of dad. The parents still. <laughs> I had a mom on the phone with that lunch. We had a mom come in to sign up for a little almost three year old. And so we sat in the office and she lifted them up and put them in the seat. And I said, There's a basket of toys on the floor that will come to play with. Would you like me to get the basket? Yeah. And I got the basket, put it next to him. And I'm like, Oh, he's fine. Just let him sit on the floor and play. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is what I'm saying. A lot of them, like, you've got to back off and let these kids. Yeah. Explore their world. And that's what we, we do. do that that's cool. We know you can do it. Exactly. <laughs> I know. We know you can. made jokes like that. No, I know you can read. Let's find. Let's let your son identify him. I know you can take his jacket off. Let's see if he can do it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but with the language, you know, a lot of our kids, I talk to my families about the social piece where they're getting their wants and needs met. Because mm -hmm. we're going to teach them how to follow directions, be okay in a group, be able to express themselves, all those things before we can even expect them to move on to the academic pieces of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So lots of language in our classrooms as well, all the time. Just commenting, questions, all of that interaction. Mm -hmm. I like that as it goes along with literacy too, because it just brings a lot of original. And I'm trying to remind you, so lots of my you know, the, the waiting and the transition to incorporating those finger plays, incorporating, you know, mm -hmm. more than just time to sing it to get but like while we're waiting, what can we do? Even in prep at the table, in prep at the carpet, open them, shut them, all those finger plays are super important. Mm -hmm. And I liked her breakdown of boys versus girls. That was something mm -hmm. I took a lot yeah. of notes on that component, like, oh, realization, I just need to be reminded of development. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Yeah. The yeah. yeah. Same thing, it's just different development. In AD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. For sure. Yeah. Comments from those guys online? I have any on discussion. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. So, there's two of them. So, <laughs> great. Mm -hmm. Leanne and Brittany, if you want to share anything, let us know. <laughs> they can hire us, which is good. Um, Type in your response. <laughs> Sharing this? Okay. Yeah, there's one. Oh, perfect. Oh, here, let me pass it. Yeah, I got the whole thing. It's just a part of all the handouts that were sent to them. So, Leanne and Brittany, there's another handout that you want to grab. Thank you. It says, what are and language components what teachers can do to support development and learning? So, was there one that we wanted to focus our conversation on either any any Is there anyone that you're not seeing as much? I've seen with my my program but we're there's not as much focus on any kind of comprehension in the reading. Which is a bummer. I just thought that yeah. Yeah, not, not that there's not as much. It's not as deep as it could be, mm -hmm. you know. It's so you can very, that farther. it's very. What color was he wearing? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know, kind of shallow in the. I know. Is it closed in the Is it Jen? Or is it Jen with the mom? The little girl that goes home and says she doesn't want to go to first school anymore, and the parents say why, and she goes because my teacher doesn't know anything. She keeps asking me <laughs> what color is it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
I love when she's talking about like I guess it's not really this whole but just like the conversations at snack time, like really taking advantage of that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They're gonna be attending because they're not going because the food's there as a reinforcer. <laughs> um, and adding the print aspect where you can like write down their story. Um, but really using that as like that one on one time. And like what you said about like the waiting time too. Like we just have to get into the habit of like we can't waste any time that they're in our classroom, especially when you have like only two or four days a week and they're only there for a couple hours, like every minute of that day needs to be purposeful and like planned out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's funny is with those times, like we've got consistent transition songs that we mm -hmm. use, you know, from inside to outside, it's always the same, but then when they're waiting, you know, for snack to finish and the other kids will join us, then they alternate like every song a month, you know, mm -hmm. for that. So it's like the, the songs that they're used to and they already know that, you know, us teachers were like, it's April, I've sang this song <laughs> since September, no, but, um, and then learning those new songs as well. Yeah. So that's good. <laughs> just think through, yeah. Okay. Um, just looking at this one, the repeat and reinforce new words. Um, something that I've learned while I was here. So while I was teaching, I would do like a word wizard, and that was like one of the classroom jobs, and I would always pick five words from the book of the week. Um, and they would get together and say the word, and then it had like the word and a picture, and they would say it to their peers. But something that I realized that I really neglected to do was to put that other word in the other place in the classroom. So, like, have those words around, like, in the dramatic play area or at blocks or near the bathroom, just, like, we could point to it and remember. You know, it's so like putting those things around as a prompt to the teachers as well as a, you know, a chance for the student to see them, to bring in those things that you've taught them. Um, you know, those waiting times when you have a break from all the songs. You know, oh, look at this. This is one of the words we learned this week. Where was it in our book? You know, trying to... Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we made the words like really big and then I just had it was like a probably like it was like a paper with like three strips. So, like the word took up like this much space and then the picture is probably like three by three if that. Um so there was something to kinda of cue them but the word was bigger. And they loved that job, but then putting that around the classroom would have been a way great way to break that out. Mm -hmm. And like with the reach of the children daily like with literacy instruction, um, so our supervisor is like the literacy guru, and like kids need to like hear a book at least like four times before they start like really processing it, and that's something that I hadn't learned before. So like we read the same book for the week, but that was them only hearing it twice. So I think so frequently we're like, oh, they're bored of it, but like they're not. <laughs> like right. they need it more. They need like you should be reading it to the point that they can really start to retell it. And mm hmm. A lot of things I did to increase like vocabulary and language too. You guys ever heard that game of like guess what or guess who? You can actually get in with like a DI or they have those things that pop up and so you could describe things during the category. Mm -hmm. kid. So you describe like instances of form of transportation or something that has three words and something that you'll have to guess the word based off of. Like a key word or even. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so I know that. Oh, I like that. I saw something at, we were at, well real fast, so Leon was, 
from Washington agreed with us that she said we're recognizing that we need to monopolize on, on snack time and interactions, even walking down the hall, waiting in line, etc., being intentional in every interaction, which is what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But I just think I loved that activity when we went and we did an actors at USBB, and they had a show and tell bag, and she had the item in the bag, but she couldn't just, like, bring it out. And the kids had to ask the questions. And um, they had, like, prompt cards for the kids, like, is it hard? Is it soft? Is it a toy? Is it this or that? And so they got to ask all these questions before she just brought it out. So one, that's always something you're trying to prompt kids to do is to ask the questions. And you had the prompt cards, but then the, then she did get to bring it out and talk about it. I just love that activity so much because we're always trying to find ways to get the kids to understand the questioning and using those questions. So mm -hmm. that was really cool. I just think too, if using open-ended questions, I think you have to plan that. Like if you just if you just wing your circle time, you're not gonna do it. Like you need to have a post-it there. Yeah, and you have to write the question on it almost. Yeah, exactly. And I saw I um I think our SLP had done this a couple of times. Where she had posted in the book as a like when you got to a certain page, like this is the question I ask here to really guide your instruction. Because if you just wing it, you're not gonna be doing that. We focused on that with the post-it notes in books, specifically for new vocabulary words, so the mm -hmm. teacher would stop so, yeah, and say, right and what do you think this word means, and then talk through it to yeah. help with that vocabulary. Yeah. And something else with our, yeah, with our word was a thing that we would do. I was like, it would have been so much more effective, too, if like I introduced the words by themselves before we read the book, and then like, when you hear this word, let me know, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I like, I think that would have been more effective rather than just working here. You're like, oh, I was an okay teacher, but I could have done so many things better. <laughs> Or it's like, I thought I was an excellent teacher until so I started hearing to be like, oh, wait a minute, I should have done. I should have done, right? <laughs> exactly. So, and I know this is for older kids, but you've got those kids during their classrooms a little bit, they're higher and they're ready for more. So something that I think would be fun to challenge them is like, they have a thing called Write the Room. So if you go around and they have like specific things, so it could be colors. And so what you do is you have like little post-its all over the room and the kids like have to look and they have the picture. So they match the symbol and they get the word and then they write the word. But I think you could do that with writing the room, but I think you could do that also with like vocabulary. You could like hide, like do kind of like a hide and go seek type thing, mm -hmm. where you have like a picture of the vocabulary, you show them the word, and then like you said, you have a, like, the word is, print is much bigger, and the picture mm -hmm. is small, and they have to go find and match the two. Yeah. I think that's a good one. Maybe not just the alphabet, just those yeah. letters, like a little scavenger hunt yeah. for the letters. Yeah, and, colors and they keep them really engaged, yeah, shapes and colors. Mm -hmm. and they loved it. Oh yeah. yeah. All the Something that our older teachers did that we could expand with words is they've taken a mini calendar, and you know the calendars have the all 12 months pictured on the back. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They disassemble the calendar, they laminate the pictures, and then they photocopy, color photocopy the back that has all of them, and they hang them around the room. And then they put the mini clipboard with the all 12 with a dry erase, so the kids go around the room to identify the photos but just to incorporate yeah, the language and literacy piece to put the word with it. Mm -hmm. Sunflower, daisy, whatever. Mm -hmm. They have insects, they have different animals, and they just, it's the easy way to start that identification. Super cute. Super yeah. Easy. And then just have, like, a couple of those objects, too. Yeah, you could do it. I mean, yeah. expanded it anyway. Mm -hmm. But, you know, just taking those dollar store calendars mm -hmm. and just laminate them, and there's, you can do one for each theme, one for each that's season. Really cool. So that's something well, that, that they did. Fun too, to, like, sit and describe. So, you could do in flowers or in pictures or whatever, you know, like oh, how many eggs does it have? Like you could incorporate so many things. Mm -hmm. Or if you're talking about a flower, what makes it special? What do you like about it? What do you like about it? What do you wish it had different, you know? Mm -hmm. All of those components. So, yeah. That's such a great way to differentiate you could match the picture, match something like talk about the picture and the mm -hmm. A range for you. A ton. And when you think about the main thing that I've taken from this is something that I try to share with my team is the exposure, 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 because my last few years in the classroom was sort of the threes, where we're just starting all of those beginning skills, but then just exposing them to things. Mm -hmm. So just having all of that available all the time would be great. Yeah. Leanne said, we love things that incorporate writing into every center, shopping list, or writing their own recipes in kitchen, or plans and block centers, science, journals, etc. Mm -hmm. Even if they just get one or two letters with their pictures, it is writing and meaningful. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Like that plans in the block centers. Yeah. My teachers have started to make the plans instead of allowing children to make plans. I'm trying to coach them. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> into, let me 
think you can create those plans rather than like mm -hmm. making the plans and posting them. I they look cute, but then the kids don't really notice them because mm -hmm. they didn't make them, they didn't have a part of it. Right. Yeah. Or well, I see that goes to classroom books too. I think that's like, I think like each kid does a page and then you have, you create a book and it goes in the library. Like that's mm -hmm. so meaningful and something that they're all very interested in. Mm -hmm. I used to love like we used to go on field trips or just any activities have anybody come in and they just take random pictures. Not even necessarily even like the whole purpose of the <laughs> the kids would come up with I saw their shoes too. Did you know their shoes had unicorns on them? And then I know <laughs> it's so even like like, it's like it's like our random book of things that we want, you know, like random wonders or something and or if the kids and then they start pointing out different things just like specifically take a picture of that. And then I'd say, Okay, what do you want to say about this? And then they would write it out and then but like she said, we like they were dictating to me. Well, right, yeah. They would start it, and then I'd say, "Oh, can you tell me more about it?" And then, yeah, they 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 but I always ask permission. Do you mind if I write it too? You know, and if they said no, I'd say, "Great," and I let them give me permission as to whether they could write it, mm -hmm. and I respected them. So mm -hmm. yeah. Really cool. I think like even just like letting them write, and like just putting like the letters in front of them, so like they have a reference. Like, oh, yeah, this is what I'm supposed to be working towards. They can kind of, you know, so, like, you don't tell them, like, write this letter and write this letter. Like, if they want to be doing it independently, just like, hey, this is here. If you want to look at it, like, help you. <laughs> but they kind of remember that goal and can get closer and closer. Yeah. yeah. And when you have magnetic letters, do you have words on the magnet board mm -hmm. for them to, you know, to copy and match? Yeah, I mean, we're not saying, you know, don't expose them to it. Exposure, 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 like you're saying. So it, it is that, and then they have the option to reflect through their mind to see that and then be able mm -hmm. to do it. Mm -hmm. So when we were talking about books for the children making books and then having them in your book nook or your library area, one of the books that we always did was how we need to clean up rooms, daily routines of lining up, wash oh, your hands, yeah. because like we would talk about going taking small groups into every <laughs> classroom area and then so like this, this is our dramatic play area this is what it looks like now let's play with it now let's stop back and you know this is what it looks like you know take a picture of before and after and they play with it now we need to clean it up and have them clean it and we make books out of that and then one of our classroom's jobs was room inspector and he would inspect the areas of the classroom and if it wasn't quite he would could get the book out and say nope not really cleaned up, and then everyone had decided that. But daily routines, like where do you hang your coat up, and where, how do you gather at the door, and how do you wash your hands, and how are you walking down the hall, and all that. We made books out of them, because then it was helping them to decide. It really seemed like it was a struggle using the bathroom today. What can we do? Oh, let's look at our book. What, how do we need to do that? And then they could go through it and use it. So we also have when a new friend joins us. So if we have a new child coming, what are the, some of the things we need to help him or her with? We yeah. made all these books that way. I love that. I like that idea. We, we've done one. Um, because of our routines and teaching them to our threes, we did what can I do at work time? Same thing with yeah. each area. And then we ended it with, and, and I can put it away. And then we wrote our own cleanup book because we needed to have the right words that we wanted right. to share. Mm -hmm. But then taking that and expanding it on that very topic, mm -hmm. you know, with the kids, I like that idea yeah. as well. That's something we could do. Just and I know they would in the classroom. <laughs> if your teachers have um, classroom jobs for children, mm -hmm. but we always had one job that was called classroom helper, and every child was um, was in that picture. So we would switch jobs once a week, but everyone was a classroom um, helper. So we had all of us, including myself and my assistant. So then, if the room, if someone, you know, like Jamie still the only one in dramatic play. Oh my gosh, we need a classroom helper. So it wasn't one person per week that was the classroom helper. It was everybody was a classroom mm -hmm. helper. So it could sense the community. So if someone needed a help getting a coat on, I think mm -hmm. we need a classroom helper to, you know, mm -hmm. help Kathy get her coat on. Anyone could help. Oh, yeah. We wanted to yeah. that that is what we're all here about. We're all in this together. Yeah. So it was our, we'd all get together and we'd have this picture of all these classroom helpers. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like the whole sense of community. Yeah. Whole, you know, sense of belonging. It's all of our responsibility. It's not just the one person to go and inspect it. I was just thinking about some illustrations I did last month. And a lot of that was, you know, like you had one person that was going around. Oh, I don't really, you know, I don't appreciate the way that so and so left the kitchen. You better come back and check that out. Or, 
Mm-hmm. You know, you've got four year olds going, hey, and I'm like, mm-hmm. okay. I like yeah. the idea of, hey, yeah, you know, like I heard that, that you, you, you still have one of our friends that's so worried you're going to play. How can we help Take a few more minutes yeah. to finish your thoughts and conversations. Like you said, creating a sense of community. This is our classroom. We all take care of it. Mm-hmm. And so and so may need to still learn how to read, but let's show them a little bit. Mm-hmm. So the books I think are great for the even like a checklist. Mm-hmm. We do that for our small group and snack, and I'll get a checklist. That's mm-hmm. similar to the book. You could always just turn that into a book mm-hmm. as well. I think it's for another book. Uh, yesterday we went to it. Last night we went to a movie, um, the documentary on the importance of early childhood. And they're probably going to do another show. I mean, it happens. I'll invite you. Um, but it was really awesome. So, um, but they, one of the things that they, one of the principal teachers did in it was they had like a problem solving um, skit kind of that the teachers did. And so the teachers would like act out, and then the kids would get to raise their hand and say like, "Oh, this is what you can do to help. This is what you can do to help." Yeah. So, but then I'm like, you could also do that as one of those books too, of like when we have a problem, these are the ways that we can, you know, ask mm-hmm. for help. Mm-hmm. That's what, that was something I wrote down. Was like this book kind of had to calm down. We have so mm-hmm. many kids. So many kids. But you just think about like it's really hard to mm-hmm. make a problem. You know, based on yeah. whatever happened in their lives, but I think if they saw themselves, like calming mm-hmm. their bodies and calming their minds mm-hmm. and doing mm-hmm. all those kind of things. Like, oh, I can do it. Yeah, like, I've done this before. Mm-hmm. No, there's me doing it again. I can do it. Yeah. Because I think at some point they get so, when it happens so often for them, they get really discouraged. I think. I mean, yeah. as an adult, I get discouraged. Like, oh, I keep messing up or whatever. Mm-hmm. I keep getting so mad. At but me. we have the capability to process through that, whereas the and kiddos mm-hmm. don't. We have to teach them. Yeah. And maybe it's what happens. Like they can see it. Mm-hmm. It's they okay to be mad. I've done this before. Yeah. yeah. And like one for each emotion. Yeah. Like when I'm mad, I do this. Like, this is what it looks like, and this is how I calm down. When I'm happy. <laughs> This is what it looks like. Well, I think there's some good books out there already done, but mm-hmm. that's so why we ended up writing our too. own, yeah. you know, because yeah. we had specific words we so wanted to teach the kids or say mm-hmm. how we do things in our center. Mm-hmm. So to write those for yourself, like if there was a template, somebody created a template that you can edit and make your own, like, okay, here's a how I mad template, but you can always adjust it for your classroom or your site. Oh, something good. Something. Yeah. <laughs> I just remembered a really cool, I just, when I went to Washington, we did the building blocks training, which was really cool, but one of the things that it had there was a conversation card, and so you just had this picture, and it had, like, all the Disney characters. So it's one paper that's laminated, and so the kids have to hold it and share it together, and then they get to talk about all the things that are on it, like, oh, I like Incredible, and I like Finding Nemo, and, like, so, like and you could do it, like, with different topics, so, like, you know, different areas of the class. Classroom. Like I like to play in the, I like to play outside, and I like to play in the in the kitchen area, or like different kinds of houses. Like it was just really, really. I loved the idea that it was like one paper with something it, like interesting that they like on it, and they had to like hold their hold it together, which made the proximity and then the conversation was easy for them. Which would be good for planning and review. Yeah, and that too. say we do planning and review with high scope, but mm-hmm. have one more tool for that. Mm-hmm. We do planning books, we do photos and all that, but get your partner or your friend next to you. And take a conversation card. Yeah, yeah, I like that conversation card. That's a great idea and something you could just make a bunch of. Mm-hmm. With, like you said, pull up a bunch of Disney books or yep. classroom topics or bugs, right? Mm-hmm. If you're thinking of bugs and then I'm just thinking even like the movies are just coming out and stuff too. Like I know Dumbo's out right now. I don't know how many kids have seen Dumbo, but they also have like How to Train Your Dragon 3. And so you could talk about like, you could even have different scenes about the movie or whatever. They could talk like, okay, you've seen this movie, you know, and you could pull it up and the kids could sit and tell each other the story of the movie. I think that would be fun too. Well, and Netflix, you could watch it on your phone and do screenshots. Oh, yeah, and sign it. Well, that's what I was going to say. When my kids were little, now we're teens and so we don't do that, but every time the new, any movie came out, I'd always go by the soundtrack because number one, I was a preschool teacher. Number two, my kids were little. So we'd, so you, like, you you know, you turn on uh, Frozen in the classroom, well, that's Elsa, you know, but there's yeah. always a conversation piece with the latest movie. So if you can, go get the soundtrack or download one or two of the songs, mm-hmm. and then you could play that and then have any of those extensions on it. Yeah. I love buying the soundtrack, but yeah. So well, that's kind of nasty because you always kind of, like, sometimes you just want music on, but no words, and, like, a lot of soundtracks have those yeah. kind of. Yeah. yeah. I would, I mean, back in the early 2000s, we bought the Pirates soundtrack and we'd play it all the time of course we were way into pirates my teacher partner and I but um you know they'd all we, and they didn't know but we'd have that on or we'd do just even like Enya you know stuff like that but to have the the movies that are out 
and have the music, and then they know, they identify that. Know, they they see they've seen it. Like you can take yeah. different screenshots and different pictures yeah. of your favorite books that the kids would like that they would like to talk to you and talk about again. Mm -hmm. So you could even do that as part of your conversation card. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Start to finish Start up your conversations, yeah. please. Yeah. I like that idea. Oh, that's cute. Yeah. 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 Well, no, usually what I notice is we are, I've been working with my teacher's city. Mm -hmm. um, so we, they love Lama Lama versus Yama. Mm -hmm. They really love, so I try to tell them, you know, Lama service, let it help. Everybody do let it help. You know, also, I brought a uh, real teacher for Lama Lama, mm -hmm. Lamas, mm -hmm. and show the, give it to the child, and, and the children were talking about, you know, what color were the Lamas. This is basically where I'm been working right now with my teachers about really mm -hmm. try to do more vocabulary mm -hmm. over there mm -hmm. and make more interesting for mm -hmm. the children mm -hmm. because where I was not in it, mm -hmm. just they were reading and reading and reading and the children mm -hmm. were born. So I tried to implement that one. Mm -hmm. Right now, bring more vocabulary, mm -hmm. bring more ideas to the teachers. Mm -hmm. And I do that one and I feel myself so I'm, then I tell the teacher, do you want me to help you? So then I do the same, and then we ask her, we talk to each other, you know, what we see, how she can improve, or how I can improve. That way she doesn't feel that I'm pointing her, you know. Mm -hmm. I see my own mistakes too. Mm -hmm. This is a great idea. Yeah, this is what I've been working. And I'm new coaching, so I try to learn more too. That's good. That's good. That's good. The one thing I was thinking about too is when she's coming to do the mentor or the coaching, mm -hmm. we should give her an address. <laughs> oh, right. Does she know where she's going? Yeah. Not important. So let's make sure to do that before we leave. Okay. okay. I'm like, come on, thinking about that? We need to give her an address. <laughs> that was the one part we forgot about coaching. We got the days figured out. The what? The days that figured out for coaching. But then I thought to myself, you may want the address. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't I, I don't know the specifics. <laughs> I'm expecting a schedule with you with an address and a phone number and staff name. <laughs> I was not really paying attention to all that. Yeah. Like, we'll get you on this day and I'm leaving on this we'll day. We'll get it. Don't you do that. We'll get it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. Hey, before we leave, do you want us to go back? Okay. Yeah. Okay, yes, we can go back. But I did want to share that when I was doing work on the help them transition. We're talking about transition outside, but we did that with three-year-olds, the imagining of it, to helping them create stuff. That's another thing that I read an article about. The digital world is taking away the ability to develop your imagining skills. So, you know, it's like all this we have to really think, and I'm, I'm doing my best to figure out ways to work with everything, but then in some ways I just want to say, no, we're just going to get rid of it and get back to the old ways. Do you mind if this sits here? I just thought about it. Mm, I don't know. <laughs> Oh. But anyway, so all of these components, you've looked at the information I shared, the research, some of the ideas that are on that weather form. Do you feel like you're seeing it in the classroom from coaches and leadership and that you're applying in the classroom? Okay, as we keep moving forward, you're going to start, I think, seeing more of what you're doing and you'll be able to celebrate even more and more and more. Now, with this one handout that I provided of the language and literacy activities that you can do that will align to the individual components. I also have this for um, math, science, social science, the arts, which are, you know, is not just creating art, but dance and movement and all that, and technology. So I'm going to share those with Jamie and then she can get them out on Google Docs. So you can have it for every content area that you teach and then that way we can just Every time I think of something, it doesn't have to be specific to language and literacy. If it's going to help you, we're going to share it through our teacher learning community. Did anyone have any questions about 
the research and looking at different activities, different experiences that you're doing with children. Did anyone from any, either the group want to share with the other group something cool and unique that you talked about in your group that you'd like to share with the other group? Don't worry. It's okay. So it's interesting that um, Jamie and I had a little conversation at lunch about people's different philosophies and understanding of children's work is play. And we were talking about it is this whole process of purposeful play that we are working towards, not let them all into the room and let them just go at it, but there's a purpose to what we're doing. And so we're in the next segment we're going to talk about our intentional strategies because what we're doing when we're actually applying some of the activities and experiences you've just explained to each other and shared with each other, you're doing it with a purpose, with an intent to be able to teach something for children. And so I included this in here so that if you come to the point where you need to explain to someone what children are doing as they're watching them play, we are doing it with intent. We are doing it with a purpose. So I just threw some information in there, and I love this first statement. Intentional teaching is to always be thinking about what we are doing and how it will foster children's development and produce real and lasting learning. That's what it's all about. We actually have a purpose for everything. And when I'm coaching with teachers, if there's something going on in their classroom and I'm asking them, you know, what is the purpose, if they, if they can't come up with something, then I'm like, you can never have it in your classroom again until you can tell me what the purpose is. Because that's what it's all about. Yes, children learn through play. Yes, we want experiences and activities that are fun for them. But we want to make sure that what we're doing is going to be able to help them to learn, not just keep them busy. We have moved in our profession from daycare to child care to early care and learning. And we want everyone to move into early care and learning. After all, we do not care for days. So we are not daycare. And prior to daycare, the step below daycare is babysitting. And have any of you ever sat on a baby in your life? So as we're moving towards helping people honor us, and what we do, we have to think about what we're doing. So we're not just playing for play, we're playing for learning. And they can have those experiences when they're playing for play, but we know we've set up the environment so that they can learn. So being intentional and supporting young children is just as important as caring for them. We're there to support their learning. And now that we have the research that backs up that 70% of the brain develops by the time a child's 18 months of age, 80% of the brain can develop by the time they're three, and 90% by the time they're five. We need to have a purpose to it. Because if we're not actually applying activities and experiences that will help the brain to develop, then it might not develop. And we need to be able to do that. Another conversation, boy, Jamie and I had all kinds of conversations today. So one of the things, and I've been very terrified because I've been reading more data about this, we've been talking about when we become the parents of our parents. And so this article I read talked about people of my age, um, down the line, may end up taking care of a parent who has dementia and Alzheimer's and maybe their own child in their 30s that has dementia and Alzheimer's because of what digital technology is doing to our brain. So think about those situations. So when we're working, there is a purpose to what we're doing, and we, if we don't develop that brain, it might not develop. So I was talking about I have a 30-year-old niece who cannot – do problem solving, critical thinking in everyday life because mom and dad have done too much for her and she still lives at home with them. And now my sister-in-law's parents are moving to that stage where they're going to have to start taking care of so they've got her parents on this end and their child on this end. So we have this opportunity to help those brain make, the brain make the connection because it's not about, you know, children, that their future is in our hands. Our future is in their hands. And we need to think about it that way. So there's a lot that goes into it and I wish that you could all be paid like rocket scientists because that's basically what this is. That we're paid what we're paid, we do what we do for the love of children. And then being intentional is a huge part of it. Every aspect of early care and education programs for children affects learning. Intentional early learning child educators are mindful about the daily schedule, the materials available to children, adaptions that individual children may need, indoor and outdoor play environments, and the engagement of families in supporting children's learning. 
So whatever we can do to support you in all that through this project we're going to be doing, I know over on the teacher side they talked about adapting for individual children's needs. Not only do you have typically developing children who have individual needs, but you've got children with unique needs, special needs, language needs. We're trying to make sure that we're covering all of that. And being intentional means recognizing each child as an individual and helping them when they're at their specific levels. Intentional teaching is to work with the outcomes for children in mind and consciously seek out every opportunity to help children achieve those outcomes. So we are looking at things with a purpose. We are reading to children not only for enjoyment, but also because it's going to help them and help their brain develop that capacity to do the critical thinking that reading can help them to do. When early learning educators and teachers use intentional teaching practices, they take an active role in children's learning. It's not just coming in for care, it's learning. There's so much learning going on. Although teachers from the kindergarten grade and first and second grade will tell us that they want us to do a lot of things with our preschoolers before they get into kindergarten, when the National Association for the Education of Young Children sends their survey out to kindergarten teachers, which they do about every two or three years, the number one thing kindergarten teachers want is for children to be self-reliant, for children to care for themselves. And I tell parents, no teacher in kindergarten is going to help your child blow their nose. They're not going to help them put their shoes on. They're not going to help them snap and unsnap their pants to go to the bathroom. They don't have the time to do it. So those are even things that we are doing. We talked a little bit with the coaching and leadership group about daily routines and why it's so important to have children learn those, the social-emotional components of it. And a lot of the language that we are going to be working with children and a lot of, you know, like posting a poster on how to wash hands and having the steps written for them to see it. Language and literacy is throughout even the daily routines and experiences that children are able to learn. All the self-help that they're doing in order for them to be self-sufficient, to be self-reliant, to have the capacity to regulate their own feelings. All of that is woven in. So in the teach practice or a specific strategy or a specific activity, you watch the children. Because if the children aren't engaged, we need to change things up to be engaged. The more the children are engaged, the more the children like what they're doing, the less behavior problems we have. So we know we need to do that. So part of our practice is not just meeting those outcomes, but observing what they're doing and making changes as we need to. Because the more we're able to modify it in the moment for them, the better it's going to be. When I was first teaching, I had a seasoned teacher who was a colleague who retired, and she gave me an index box. And the index box was divided by months, and there was activities for every month. And she was like, if you're going to be successful, here it is. Take this, you will be successful. And I was like, thank you. I don't have to do anything else. It's all here. And when I started doing things with kids, I was like, this isn't working. And so I called her, and she said, well, yeah, the kids might not like it, but, you know, it's going to work. It's going to work. So all I kept thinking is she did the same activities every single year whether the kids were engaged or not. No wonder she told me that one of the hardest things to do is get these kids to behave because she wasn't engaging them. So I took a lot of her activities and I tried some of them. If it didn't work, I changed it in the moment for the kids. Intentional. We need to be intentional about that. Um, intentional teachers are purposeful when they use their knowledge of child development and content standards to decide what to teach. So there is a method to our madness. We're not just teaching to teach. We're not just doing it to keep them busy. We have human beings as the most critical part of their lives for brain development. So we need to realize that, honor that, and apply practices so that we are helping that to happen. Intentional teachers also embed intentional teaching strategies in the decisions as they make plans, organize the physical learning environment, engage children in the context of play, real life engagements, and routines and transitions. Everything we're doing has a purpose to it. And so we have to honor that and reflect that and be able to then apply it. Intentional teachers ask, what am I trying to accomplish? 
What are my children's relevant experiences and needs? What approaches and materials are available to help me challenge every child? What is the best setting? When and where should the learning experiences occur? How will I know whether and when to change my strategy or modify my instruction? What information will I accept as evidence that my children and I are experiencing success? Now, it's not like you stop and go, you just do it. But all of this is what it is about to be intentional. So when we're thinking about the language and literacy activities that you're already doing, or as you're learning more through the project, keep that in mind. You're going to be modifying and adapting it to your individual teaching style and practice. And then you're going to be modifying and adapting it for children. For those of you in the coaching and leadership support role, we talk about how the teachers have all these children that they need to individualize for. You have all the teachers you need to individualize for. So you're going to be working with individual styles, individual practice, and individual systems for intentional teaching. Yeah, it can be very difficult, very difficult. So we're all working from this from our own paradigms and perspectives, but we've got some sound strategies within the intentional teaching experience and system that if we can use them as a core, teachers you'll reflect and say, yes, this is what I do. And coaches you can say, oh, this is what one teacher does. This is what another teacher does. This is what one teacher might need to be doing. So the next page is all about literacy, language, intentional teaching strategies. So what I want you to do is just like read through them, place a check mark next to the ones as a teacher that you know that you apply, as a coach or leadership support, think about the individual teachers that you work with, which ones are applying some of those things, and maybe which ones might be helpful to a specific teacher. Talk to, um, do your think, pair, share with others in the group, talk to each other, have some discussion about these practices, and then we'll move on.
Coming back together. So when you were reflecting on the strategies, intentional strategies, how did you do as teachers? Okay, got the balance in there. I'd be really worried about you if you weren't doing any of them. If you got a good balance, then we're doing okay. And then coaches, I saw a lot of note taking. So, you know, reflecting and seeing, you know, which teachers you need to work on, which with, you know, and go ahead and say, so go ahead and you say, so your coach, Kathy, told you to tell them. Okay? Okay. And do you want to share what we were just talking about? So when the coaches are in coaching meetings, I was just talking to her about how the intention was to go out in within classrooms and work. But we're talking about how she could do in a coaching meeting so you come together as a professional learning community and ask more questions and you know say you went and you talked with you know Irma about this and she's just not getting it so how do we do it better Kathy just coming together would that be effective I know you're gonna be gone right can you do it from a webinar where, where are you gonna be you're gonna be in Europe <laughs> no I'm just teasing you don't think of us but I mean, you know, it's like, I think that would be helpful. So we'll take a look at the schedule and see how that works out. But I mean, because a lot of, you know, what we're trying to do is make sure that the capacity for this grows. And so one of the things to do would be to help those of you that are helping the teachers. And then of course, get into your classrooms too and bug you like crazy. But as far as what we're talking about with intentional teaching strategies, a lot of times you're just doing this in a natural process and you're not even realizing that this is what's going on. And what I want to do is I want to show you a couple video clips of some teachers. And so if you flip the page, we are not going to be able to do the first one, but we might be able to do that when we come together next time because it's a hilarious video the teacher measuring with child, but we will be looking at Sharon and journal writing. And what I just want you to do is just watch the video. When the clip about Sharon is done, we'll stop it. And then you can go through and you can check off, like, what is she doing? Because a lot of times you may think you're not doing this, but you probably are, because a lot of it comes naturally. So let's take a look at the videos, if we can pull them back up. Oh, I can sit here. You can sit here for a minute. And for coaches, now this is, um, we'll talk about, okay, this is actually on YouTube. So that if you want to use it with more teachers, uh -huh. it's the Creative Curriculum in Action Intentional Teaching Video on YouTube. Okay. Okay, well, he's right there. Because did he turn that speaker down? Where did apples come from? From the tree. Okay. Sharon has established a routine at arrival time for children to draw and write in their journals. Good morning, Eliana. We're studying trees, so I suggested that they might want to write something about trees in their journals. What do you want me to know about this?
writing and the children begin to understand that the spoken word can be written down. Sharon uses what she knows about Bryce's personal experiences to accept and honor his story about trees. This is a daddy tree me sick and a baby tree sick too. Okay. This is the daddy tree. Which one's a daddy tree? Uh, the one here. Sharon reflects on how she uses journals to build relationships with children. It's an excellent time for me to have just a, a brief moment to be one-on-one. -on -one. It was wonderful. Today, it is my pleasure to introduce Kylie Burke, author and director of Curriculum and Assessment and Teaching Strategies. Take your time. Extend. I think it'd be really. Other than asking the questions, it's not where she needed to give any assistance. I bet when they first started this experience, she had to give more assistance to help children get used to the routines and the expectations and giving them some assistance. What about some direction? Not at this time. They know the routine. They're doing it. Did she consider the setting? It's at arrival time. So for her, that's when it's working. Children come in, they take their journal, they're writing about what they know. She has an opportunity to talk to some of them one-on-one. -on -one. So she did, in my opinion, consider it a good time to do it for her practice. It might not be that journals will work in your classrooms at that time, but for her, it's working, and they're consistent, and they're playing independently while she's working one-on-one with, -on -one with children. Did she give any encouragement? So encouragement you can take to the whole body language, the closeness. If you can picture, go back in your mind, the little girl is intent on watching and participating and budding up to and developing a relationship with Sharon. She is watching Sharon write. She is doing everything. What did the little boy do? He tells her and then he's off. And so what she does is she asks him a question to bring him back. So in a way, you consider that almost to be encouragement to keep him going. Because if she didn't say which one of them is the daddy tree, she could have lost him totally. But he is just like, and one of their other video clips, if you choose to look at some more of these, one time he's sitting there like this, as there's like a story going on. He's like moving like crazy, because that's what he needs. But she wants him to continue, so she does it in that fashion. We talked about modeling, asking questions. She did ask some questions, some open-ended questions. Did she provide him the information? No, nope, just reset what they did. And did she scaffold on any learning? Hard to tell because we don't know. We know that she's helping them make some connections to what they're telling her, but we don't know how much she's scaffolding. So when you're doing intentional practices, do you need to do all of these? No. But she's got a good balance there, a good balance going, and keeping them engaged and being respectful to them. And it doesn't take much for them to be able to do something in their journal and then for her to be able to add the components of language and literacy for it. But I always love watching because it's a true difference right there between a little girl being engaged in an activity like this and a little boy. You can see it right there. So the next one is Carol cooking. So let's take a look and see how she does. We get okay. Oh, it's a different. So it's it's not the right video.
in the discovery area happens during choice time, which begins as children arrive. Look at this, Jonathan. Today we are going to make bread balls. And I'm going to need your help. Carol prepares Jonathan to be a baker. All right, Jonathan, here is your bowl. And we've got to read these ingredients. It says we need one cup of hot water. During the cooking project, she uses a variety of teaching strategies. Do you know why people wear one of these hats? It's to keep their hair out of their face when they're doing, when they're cooking. How many eggs do we need? Would you check the recipe chart? Let's see. Hmm. This says two tablespoons of butter and one egg. We need one egg. That's a good technique. Just kind of on the side like that. There you go. I think you and your grandmother must have cooked together before. Carol purposefully integrates content learning. I'm going to blend it. We're going to need to do that. The next step. As children use math. One cup is all the way up here to this red line. So it looks like we're going to need more water. More what? Science. Wind to be liquid like water. Do you remember that when he first started stirring it? Now look what's happening. What is it? Look how it's starting to stick together. Literacy, and then we're going to keep reading as we go along. In water, mm -hmm. in eggs, with spoon. This is a new word, need. Need. That's, the K is silent. You are right. That and social studies. Sometimes me and my Grammy cook, 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 roll, mm -hmm. and I help her. You and your Grammy do that together? Yeah, and, and, and you know what I get to do? What's that? I, I get to mush my... You get to mush your own rolls? Well, I tell you what, that's the job that you're going to have today also. You're going to need to knead the dough. Roll it. Move it. Language is rich as children make observations. It really happened when, when I started mixing. Describe what they experience. It's really... Man, here we go. Use new vocabulary. Because it says that we have to combine. Do you know what combine means? Mix together. Mix together. And make connections. A baby bear ball. <laughs> it's a baby bear ball. Upon reflection, Carol describes why the experience was successful. Look at, Look at the size of some of these. I am very intentional as I plan experiences for young children. I think about the materials. I think about how to integrate the content standards. You know how much water I drink every day? How much? Eight glasses. I drink a lot of water. I, 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 I drink are engaged because it's real work. It's meaningful work. It's relevant work. He said, uh-huh, I know what... Okay, so let's reflect on Carol. Was there any acknowledging and describing that she participated in? And then did she give specific feedback? A little bit. She tends to carry the conversation on more than engaging the children. She misses a lot of opportunity to actually have them communicate more with her and for them to communicate with each other. And this happens a lot with teachers. So coaches and leadership watch this and then teachers think about your own practice. A lot of times we tend to talk to the children that have language, not necessarily talk as much to the children that don't have the language. The little girl, when she was like, it's a baby bear ball, all she did was like, uh-huh, it's a baby bear ball. And when the little girl said, ooh, it's gooey, she didn't even acknowledge her. And when the little boys are working together, she's talking to the one that has the most language, the one that knows what combined is, the one that knows it's a silent K. The other little boy, she started talking with him, but then when the other boy joined, she kind of gave that up. And the other thing that she does is she gives too much language for them when they're measuring with the water and she's like we need and before he can even answer more water she says more water so we have to think about those kind of things when we're acknowledging and describing and giving feedback we have to think about are we doing too much and not giving them the opportunity and are we including everybody in that practice um did she do some demonstration and modeling yeah she did a lot of it to help them see and give assistance. 
She did. What about some directions? Yep, directions and guidance. Did she consider the setting? So this is what they call in the discovery area, and it's an arrival time. So those are the, t it's the time of day she chose and the place she chose to do it. So in my opinion, she did. Because if she only wants a few children to come to her, then she has it in an area where only a few children can actually work. And she also has it during a time of day where children are arriving, not all at once, but slowly coming in. So her cooking experience could be more successful instead of having it when all 18 or 20 children are there and at a large table. She wants to manage it. So she chose arrival time in a small area of the classroom. The only other thing I would have done differently is closer to water to wash hands. That's how I look at that kind of thing. So I think she did consider the setting to have it be effective for her. I don't know. We could ask her. Maybe she didn't. Maybe that's just what she does. But I try to look for those kind of things when I'm setting up for children's success. Did she do any encouragement? She did. Like even just thinking of the little guy cracking the egg, by not ignoring him and talking with him that that is a good technique, she could have explained what technique meant. But to acknowledge that he's trying to do something and then to hold the bowl, that encouraging him to, to keep doing and to be successful and keep going. Because, you know, cracking eggs is hard. So helping him through that process. We talked about modeling. She did ask questions. She did provide information. And I think she did do some scaffolding, but I think she could have done it a little bit more differently so that children could actually then scaffold. So again, we don't have to do all of these strategies, but a lot of them you're just doing. You're just naturally doing. What you need to do as teachers is kind of reflect on when you are doing stuff and determine what you could have done differently. And then as coach or coaching and leadership comes in, you're looking at teachers and helping them see patterns. So when you're thinking about these practices as a teacher, Try not to do everything we're talking about all day long, every day. If you feel like you need to practice a little more on, like, encouragement, pick one day that you're going to practice with it at one time during the day. If you're going to practice more of talking to children that don't have a lot of language, pick one activity during the day, one time of the day you're going to talk with them. If you try to do everything that you're learning through any workshop or any project like this, all day long, you're going to stumble, and the kids will know it. So choose the time. It's like intentionally planning when you're going to enhance your practices. So questions or thoughts? Seems like a lot of you understand intentional practices, and it seems like you've got some strategies that you're applying. And then we'll just keep building on them to see how they reflect upon with the language literacy component. So any thoughts or questions? All right, let's go ahead and take a break. So if we could have everybody be back by 20 minutes till, I'd really appreciate it. All right, let's come back together. So the next activity, we're going to start looking at um, language and literacy throughout the day. So I think we can do this as just a, a group in doing this. I don't know if you want to just... If you two ladies would want to roll your chairs over and we make one group and you can have a discussion amongst yourselves, and then again, I'll provide you a resource to um, extend that. So it's on this page and it's just talking about the different components of a daily schedule and what kind of literacy and language activities and experiences do you either see in the classrooms if you're a coach and, and leadership or that you're applying in your classrooms. So you can have a conversation about that, and then I do have a handout that has some ideas on what to do during each of these times. So if you ladies would like to just roll over and we
Turn the microphones on, and now none of you are talking. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone online is waiting to hear some conversations. <laughs> I didn't know that's what you were doing. <laughs> I need to include everybody. I'll get the ones that are until our large big meeting. So, yeah. anyone else have something for arrival time? Just different. Uh, Sign in, cubby tags, and answering the question on the board is what's already been okay. identified. Then we have, you have to just comment on each child something when we greet them. Mm -hmm. We have a large group activity, gathering activity. The calendar. I, uh, we moved on the large group meeting. Now to that. Yes, I guess we have. We do some writing. We, we stretch. We count, count the kids. kids. Or they just mean or do our set or whatever. Some do development. Do we do our own. Oh, I like the journal idea. The message board identifying what's going on for the day. You know what I mean? Embedded. Worksheet type. Well, and I like the journaling. Oh, it's so nice for all-day program, like from 6.30 to 5.30. And uh, so the first large group meeting is usually a read aloud that can be centered for children. And it's usually mm -hmm. with a back loop, social, emotional mm -hmm. topic. Um, then that helps the kids right. reset mm -hmm. and move on to the rest of the day. Actually, quite Two hours after they've been there. Bad babe. Mommy told me she did journaling in her special ed class. I didn't know what that would look like. I'd be willing to try it. Yeah, in our large group we also sing, song, read books, and talk about our, our schedule. schedule of the day. We do um, four transitioning out of large group, which is a the question in the three. So they have a question, uh -huh. so it's an ask and letter, and the sound. Excuse the children. And then we do the table. The table had that changes to the Whether it's block, identifying something where it or at all. Where it's language or at all. Where it's language or any mm -hmm. sort of. I have a new idea for that. Also, we also do talk about, like, at least in a large and small all go over the forming of a letter and write it in the sky and all the kind of stuff together. And then we have a quick staff question. We lost the center when the outside time. So going with center and choice time is first thing that they start with all of the choices in the past. Making a plan, sharing their plan. Going through. Another thing we did in the past that I guess you can't do for planning a planning time, we did looking through a two choice book, found. writing down, drawing mm -hmm. a picture yeah. of where they're going to play, and then we'd like open, open, open someone open 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 it to the area. Then there would be pictures. Using the telephone, the microphone, initial sound. We calling each other on cell phones. Amber started that. Amber Burr. Yeah. All of the areas are defined by mm -hmm. the large group. That's when you do your story time too, isn't it? Yeah, we'll do um so although we're following when we up to the curriculum, that's when we'll do we a transition and a literacy. 
or a nursery rhyme. Like the buds or and, bring that um, light time. On Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, they've turned the Our speech rules. therapist they take they turned the, the book that we the song. The activity the rules rules around. Around. Where I oh, and the chart does and the opening circle song. read the book. Which I, the first time I went in there to help, I was like, has a bunch of activities to do. So it helps the the language kids with their speech goals, but it also helps the higher kids like learn that the letter and the sound and then the words. We're in the school district. Which district are you from? Come in to me. We count them one day. And facilitate. Is it a daycare center? During the work time. Okay. Is it a solution? You are talking about the reason he said cash my attention to us. Yeah, so our preschool. Our time is partially special ed students are partially typically developing. You know, so we do offer a speech therapy Maybe as part of other the other ideas to implement like this. Yeah. Are you, you kindergarten? No. One teacher takes a minute and makes must be some sort of Well, you still are always talking about everything out there. Sure. We're talking about the birds and we're talking about the. The feathers they find and the bugs and the whatever. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be nice experience. It'd be great to yeah, just it's start nice doing to have to, you know, just you to really bring, bring around the roses out get there. Get them to tolerate it. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. A little bit of she organizing to start, start today. today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Today we have the parachute. Let's go up down, up, down. Now we're not. Or the beanbag. You know, we've sometimes in years past put out a couple different stations out there. Um, um, the water table we've done so we really good help when the weather permits and just awesome. bubbles and water. Yeah, but it here it's not like yeah, mm -hmm. it works but the time start expanding the table outside, but I did mm -hmm. beanbag toss chalk, you know, and draw the lines of the circles mm -hmm. and then the beanbags have oh, words on them. Really, so really good for him. Different levels. Mm -hmm. Good. And then the preposition was I mean, so with like a little group on top. You went so far. We did a ton of expanding so much. We could do because I feel like every, you know, out in the wood even though our math and science has language, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nope, the wood like should stay easy. on the ground. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, not letting the stays out there. <laughs> 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 yeah, and, yeah. No, they just and don't they throw them. Like, we didn't say they couldn't scoot so much <laughs> this year. It just takes a little so direction. More words. I love Oh, I think so. Like, uh, I made the equipment cards by off the borrowed uh, kits from the mm -hmm. so Hubble Creek classroom. And, and we'll just like, give them each a stack well, yeah. and they put them in order and tell us the story. I like, I like the invitation and to play. We'll do like the three year olds, like a yeah. three part sequence. Keep but their like imagination is going, especially with that fairy tale unit. They pieces. really got into it with them. Uh -huh. And then they Have put it together and then retelling the story and then the giving them the materials. Kids and they can now you tell the story with these materials. We could go through one or two. Um, wow, those Billy Goats are really sequencing activities. Look over that bridge. But that was that got had a lot of language, especially for those SLI kids. You want to follow me? Um, we did. Um, if your small group was an activity where you're following the directions and we had material to make their own houses when we did the, either left the right traditional tail, down the, the we so we track that that the we our charts are we put out a lot of material for us in one too. small group. Let them build their houses open, you know, the small and then try to blow each other's houses down. down. That was you guys have those too, right? You left the toolkit that I ran for the whatever time. Yes, but we don't always. The reason why we don't do um, spend so much time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You guys do a lot of coming in too often. There's a lot of talking about whatever we're doing. Really it's art, an it's art activity or whatever. Yeah, all the discussions about kill and drop <coughs> so there. That worksheet. Do you know what color they're using? Well, I'm at the I think with the meal time, or, you know, yeah. mm -hmm. access. To the meal, we're asking them to interact with each other. But also at this point in the year, there's conversation with each other. Asking what they and need. And because you know we've like taught them, even if you don't listen, we uh, sit around the table, yeah, time to talk, and they really start like we don't even have to really promote that anymore. They sit and down and chat. Yeah, conversation. Do you don't provide talking? Oh, we do? Uh -huh. Yeah, we just snack. 
Oh, yeah, they have the shower. Oh, it's kind of like the shower. Oh, yeah. They're, they're only there, like, in the morning. They're home by lunch. So they're not verbal. Oh, they're not verbal. Yeah. That makes sense. I used to just throw a rice to get everybody one. They love it. On what they are doing in the day, it's like, you don't know what we are eating. But also, it's just like, they just small. Just stand on that and get those things. It's just that I thought, and just cheese balls. Are they there all day?
mm-hmm. when they right, read their reading like chart. We talk about their kids. Oh, what books did you read? And 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 find, you know, yeah, did did you read to your mom or did she read to you? Which, of course, they can't read, but sometimes they'll tell them the story. That's been an addition to our rival this year. Did you ever, have you ever done that on the reading chart? I know you used to cover up words in your song chart mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like Humpty Dumpty or whatever. Well, it's like and also you know, like, uh, what else is Humpty Dumpty? Mm-hmm. It's, it's mm-hmm. hard mm-hmm. to think mm-hmm. 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 mm-hmm.
these people went to a meeting, these people, mm -hmm. whatever. We have to be a little plant where they followed a I'm sure sequence of putting the dirt in, planting the seed, in your covering it up, watering mini the calendar. seed. Mini calendar. We did that with the seed. And then you put all the pictures all around the end of that. that. Oh, what would she say? She was just telling me how you gave her the card. I was just thinking when we were over here earlier. Yeah, but she after she made a little. That hopefully mm -hmm. it will make our cards will be different. I know we won't have a bloom by Mother's Day. Oh, yeah. Hopefully we'll have a but start of the apple all around the room. So <laughs> and then I just said if you're doing a card and you're doing a card, they're not time lapse. They don't have to be a bingo the marigolds being planted, yeah. just like we did. Mm -hmm. Like I made sure that no. like the containers were the same so they could like see we did that. And then they watch the flower grow. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Did, yeah. Did, yeah. did she talk about it the could butterfly? Be that perfect size. Yeah. She told me to mount the card shot so that they're yeah. colored. Yeah. 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 That'd be so cute. Butterfly, you were pretty yeah. I love that idea. I just got to think. Because they were all pretty excited. Wait, this isn't magic. Sometimes in the same conversation. You do that outside, don't you? I mean, you go on a nature walk or something. But they were, yeah, but they were something we're just pretty excited. It's like, she's a very good thing, her imagination. And then we make type of light by trying to make all the caterpillar And that was really interesting. I'd love to see some water and see people with their little purple fuzzy pipe cleaner glasses, you know? Because they hit them, we could put them all around the school. Who's catching all of them? Oh, bless you. I would do that. I know I'd hear from all the classes. Oh, this is so cool. Sorry, everyone. And we start even just throughout the center in the foyer. And I, we could mimic your clipboard. Where did you get the growing up for waiting time? You know, I was where there was school waiting to eat. I could put so when we bring it, we'd always have like a bird. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, we have to print well, caterpillar well, and turn well, into yeah, a butterfly. But I don't even find things around and about in the foyer. Insect world. So you have to put it out. Is that any of us? Like it was so easy when I was trying to work out. Or maybe think about how to use the hallway a little bit. But they're not everywhere. For those waiting times. All right, everybody. Let's come back together. So you just buy the caterpillar. So listening to what all of you do, you are embedding a lot of activities and experiences throughout your day, different components of your day that actually enhance the literacy and language development of the children. And then I just shared a handout that has even more ideas that you, a lot of you are looking at, oh yeah, I forgot we did that. Oh yeah, we're doing this. Oh yeah, try that. So we want to make sure that as we're talking, we are seeing this happening through the day. For children of this age, it's more prominent for them to be able to see and learn things all day long, not let's stop and do a literacy activity. It's carrying it on through the day. And there's so much that you're doing that supports this practice. Um, when I come into classrooms, I will be looking for these kind of things and seeing what you're doing and asking, you know, have you thought about doing it this way or have you tried this strategy or, oh, that's a really cool idea. I'm going to steal it from you and take it to the next person. It's basically coming in and it is coaching. It is advising. It's looking and seeing what's going on, thinking about what I can do to help in the moment but then also thinking about like what additional resources you might need that I can send to you. It's, it's building that capacity to actually watch teachers in practice and then help. So from the co coaching perspective and leadership perspective, it'll be like learning from you, understanding what you're all doing, and then helping you to then help all your teachers. So we're hoping that for the coaching, it, it'll be as individualized as much as possible and working on it. Our goal is to focus on the language and the literacy experiences that you're providing in your classroom. But if you have a concern with a child with some behavior or you've got a parent that's, you know, really not doing things effectively, I will help in any way I can, even like you're talking about your hall activities. When you're coming up, Kathy, we've been trying this at the center. It's just not working. Use me and abuse me. Pick my brain as much as you want because this is not the only area I know. I'm considered to be a generalist or a specialist in the field of ECE. 
so I know so much. I have so many resources. I want to share as much as I can. That's my legacy is to help all of you based on what I'm learning from other people and what I've learned in my practice. So when I come in for, for coaching, I'm going to let you like guide me through what you want to have happen in your classroom. If you have a specific theme that you want me to observe and to look at, then that's what I need to know. And, and it, you can tell me right there in that morning to do it. I don't take any surveys in or evaluation forms. I bring in just a regular old writing tablet, and I just take notes. And then I come up with suggestions, and when we have an opportunity to share, then you ask me, I ask you, and we're just coming together to help strengthen the practice that you have in place. If there's anything that you learn during the trainings and you go back into your classrooms and try it, or for you that are leading staff and coaching staff, if you're trying to help a teacher do something that you learned in the training and it's working well, share it so we can celebrate. Or if you need more help with it, ask me in the moment, and then we'll go from there. So we're going to wrap up today right now. There was one more activity that I was going to do with a book, but it takes about a half hour to 40 minutes. We don't have sufficient amount of time to do it, so we will tie it into next session. It'll go really well with the, the read aloud information we're going to be sharing, so we might plug it in there or someplace else. And I want you to, to think about, you know, some of the things that you've actually captured today. There is a just a simple little what I call web on the back to maybe drop down some information of what you'd like to be able to remember and to actually practice in your classrooms or to take back and help other teachers. Um, Jamie just started passing out. Next session on the 29th, I'd like you all to bring in your favorite children's book that you like to incorporate with children. So even coaches, I'm sure you've got favorite children's book. Um, that way we can use them, you can talk about them, because we will be talking about the read aloud process, we'll be talking about storytelling next time, we're going to be talking about writing activities, and we're going to be talking about the talking, the singing, the having fun with children. So we're going to be talking about those and developing strategies. So bring in your favorite children's book so that you can share, and then we'll grow from there and develop things from that book and think about your classroom all day long and helping teachers all day long. So take some time to reflect on some information that you would like to capture from this session. There's this spot here to write, or you can go back into the handout and remember stuff, write maybe more teachers' names down of who you're going to work with on things, but just take some time to gather your thoughts, reflect, and then we'll open it up one more time for any questions about what we're going to do. And again, thank you all for your patience as we're working through all this to make it as you know best we can for all of you. That's what our goal is. So take some time to reflect, think, and then we'll wrap up one more time with some questions or if you have any other thoughts you need to share. Thank you.
those of you that were here this morning when you wrote out your favorite literacy activity, we are going to save those for next session. So I don't know if you want to leave yours here. Are you going to be here on the training? I'll be able to be, be the training. Okay. Because we may get more teachers and coaches that join us. And so I'd rather do that as we keep, you know, if we add a group instead of having you all share and then we put it on Google Docs and we have to put more. So bring those with you. We're going to send them out, so make sure that you two do that, and then if any of your team joins us, they can do it. But we'll, we'll look at those when we come back on the 29th and have an opportunity to share with other people, and then that will start also the process of sharing through Google Docs for our teacher learning community, of sharing different ideas out there. But I just thought I don't want to share and then have to bring in more, and we're having people at different um, segments, I guess, or different, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. I can't think of that right now. But anyway, so bring that back with you next time, and we're going to email it out to everybody or get it through Google Docs too. So does anyone have any other questions or thoughts? Okay, well, I thank you all for coming and hanging in with us, and hopefully this is information that's being, you know, it's going to be helpful to you and not hurtful that it's not going to be so much like, oh, my gosh, i got to change so much in my practice. But looking at honoring what you're already doing, understanding that what you're doing does have a purpose to it and that what you're doing is helping children to increase their literacy and language development and skills and that maybe you're going to get some new ideas that can help you just enhance your practice. So thanks for joining us on this journey and for making this commitment to stick with us through next March and have some fun while we're doing it. If you have any questions at all, you can, you know, work with Jamie. Otherwise, I look forward to seeing everybody back here in a couple weeks. And have a great weekend. And if you celebrate Easter, have a fantastic Easter. Don't eat too much chocolate. Save it for me. But enjoy yourself. Enjoy the rest of your beautiful day. And be safe for those of you that are traveling. Thank you so much.